Chapter 7, Part 1 of The Life of Nelson by Robert Southey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Nelson separates himself from his wife. Northern Confederacy. He goes to the Baltic under Sir Hyde Parker. Battle of Copenhagen and subsequent negotiation. Nelson is made a Viscount. Nelson was welcomed in England with every mark of popular honour. At Yarmouth, where he landed, every ship in the harbour hoisted her colours. The mayor and corporation waited upon him with the freedom of the town, and accompanied him in procession to church with all the naval officers on shore, and the principal inhabitants. Bonfires and illuminations concluded the day, and on the morrow the volunteer cavalry drew up and saluted him as he departed, and followed the carriage to the borders of the county. At Ipswich the people came out to meet him, drew him a mile into the town, and three miles out. When he was in the Agamemnon he wished to represent this place in Parliament, and some of his friends had consulted the leading men of the corporation. The result was not successful, and Nelson, observing that he would endeavour to find a preferable path into Parliament, said there might come a time when the people of Ipswich would think it an honour to have had him for their representative. In London he was feasted by the city, drawn by the populace from Ludgate Hill to Guildhall, and received the thanks of the Common Council for his great victory and a golden-hilted sword with diamonds. Nelson had every earthly blessing except domestic happiness. He had forfeited that forever. Before he had been three months in England, he separated from Lady Nelson. Some of his last words to her were, I call God to witness, there is nothing in you or your conduct that I wish otherwise. This was the consequence of his infatuated attachment to Lady Hamilton. It had before caused a quarrel with his son-in-law, and occasioned remonstrances from his truest friends, which produced no other effect than that of making him displeased with them, and more dissatisfied with himself. The Addington administration was just at this time formed, and Nelson, who had solicited employment, and been made vice-admiral of the Blue, was sent to the Baltic, as second in command under Sir Hyde Parker, by Earl St. Vincent, the new First Lord of the Admiralty. The three northern courts had formed a confederacy for making England resign her naval rights. Of these courts, Russia was guided by the passions of its Emperor Paul, a man not without fits of generosity and some natural goodness, but subject to the wildest humours of caprice and crazed by the possession of greater power than can ever be safely or perhaps innocently possessed by weak humanity. Denmark was French at heart, ready to cooperate in all the views of France, to recognize all her usurpations and obey all her injunctions. Sweden, under a king whose principles were right and whose feelings were generous, but who had a taint of hereditary insanity, acted in acquiescence to the dictates of two powers whom it feared to offend. The Danish navy at this time consisted of twenty-three ships of the line, with about thirty-one frigates and smaller vessels exclusive of guard ships. The Swedes had eighteen ships of the line, fourteen frigates and sloops, seventy-four galleys and smaller vessels, besides gunboats, and this force was in a far better state of equipment than the Danish. The Russians had eighty-two sail of the line and forty frigates. Of these there were forty-seven sail of the line at Kronstadt, Revel, Petersburg and Archangel, but the Russian fleet was ill-manned, ill-officered and ill-equipped. Such a combination, under the influence of France, would soon have become formidable, and never did the British cabinet display more decision than in instantly preparing to crush it. They erred, however, in permitting any petty considerations to prevent them from appointing Nelson to the command. 
the public properly murmuring at seeing it entrusted to another and he himself said to earl st vincent that circumstanced as he was this expedition would probably be the last service that he should ever perform the earl in reply besought him for god's sake not to suffer himself to be carried away by any sudden impulse the season happened to be unusually favourable so mild a winter had not been known in the baltic for many years when nelson joined the fleet at yarmouth he found the admiral a little nervous about dark nights and fields of ice but we must brace up said he these are not times for nervous systems i hope we shall give our northern enemies that hailstorm of bullets which gives our dear country the dominion of the sea we have it and all the devils in the north cannot take it from us if our wooden walls have fair play before the fleet left yarmouth it was sufficiently known that its destination was against denmark some danes who belonged to the amazon frigate went to captain Ryu and telling him what they had heard begged that he would get them exchanged into a ship bound for some other destination they had no wish they said to quit the british service but they entreated that they might not be forced to fight against their own country there was not in our whole navy a man who had a higher and more chivalrous sense of duty than ryu tears came into his eyes while the men were speaking without making any reply he instantly ordered his boat and did not return to the amazon till he could tell them that their wish was effected the fleet sailed on the twelfth of march mr van sittart sailed in it the british cabinet still hoping to obtain its end by negotiation it was well for england that sir hyde parker placed a fuller confidence in nelson than the government seems to have done at this most important crisis her enemies might well have been astonished at learning that any other man should for a moment have been thought of for the command but so little deference was paid even at this time to his intuitive and all-commanding genius that when the fleet had reached its first rendezvous at the entrance of the Kattegat, he had received no official communication whatever of the intended operations his own mind had been made up upon them with its accustomed decision all i have gathered of our first plans said he i disapprove most exceedingly honour may arise from them good cannot i hear that we are likely to anchor outside of cronenberg castle instead of copenhagen which would give weight to our negotiation a danish minister would think twice before he would put his name to war with england when the next moment he would probably see his master's fleet in flames and his capital in ruins the dane should see our flag every moment he lifted up his head mr van sittart left the fleet at the score and proceeded in a frigate with a flag of truce precious time was lost by this delay which was to be purchased by the dearest blood of britain and of denmark according to the danes themselves the intelligence that a british fleet was seen off the sound produced a much more general alarm in copenhagen than its actual arrival in the roads for their means of defence were at that time in such a state that they could hardly hope to resist still less to repel an enemy on the twenty first nelson had a long conference with sir hyde and the next day addressed a letter to him worthy of himself and of the occasion mr van sittart's report had then been received it represented the danish government as in the highest degree hostile and their state of preparation as exceeding what our cabinet had supposed possible for denmark had profited with all activity of the leisure which had so impolitically been given her the more i have reflected said nelson to his commander the more i am confirmed in opinion that not a moment should be lost in attacking the enemy they will every day and hour be stronger we never shall be so good a match for them as at this moment the only consideration is how to get at them with the least risk to our ships 
here you are with almost the safety certainly with the honour of england more entrusted to you than ever yet fell to the lot of any british officer on your decision depends whether our country shall be degraded in the eyes of europe or whether she shall rear her head higher than ever again do i repeat never did our country depend so much on the success of any fleet as on this how best to honour her and abate the pride of her enemies must be the subject of your deepest consideration supposing him to force the passage of the sound nelson thought some damage might be done among the masts and yards though perhaps not one of them but would be serviceable again if the wind be fair said he and you determine to attack the ships and crown islands you must expect the natural issue of such a battle ships crippled and perhaps one or two lost for the wind which carries you in will most probably not bring out a crippled ship this mode i call taking the bull by the horns it however will not prevent the revel ships or the swedes from joining the danes and to prevent this in my humble opinion a measure absolutely necessary and still to attack copenhagen for this he proposed two modes one was to pass cronenberg taking the risk of danger take the deepest and straightest channel along the middle grounds and then coming down the garbar or king's channel attack the danish line of floating batteries and ships as might be found convenient this would prevent the junction and might give an opportunity of bombarding copenhagen or to take the passage of the belt which might be accomplished in four or five days and then the attack by draco might be made and the junction of the russians prevented supposing them through the belt he proposed that a detachment of the fleet should be sent to destroy the russian squadron at revel and that the business of copenhagen should be attempted with the remainder the measure he said may be thought bold but the boldest measures are the safest the pilots as men who had nothing but safety to think of were terrified by the formidable report of the batteries of elsineur and the tremendous preparations which our negotiators who were now returned from their fruitless mission had witnessed they therefore persuaded sir hyde to prefer the passage of the belt let it be by the sound by the belt or anyhow cried nelson only lose not an hour on the twenty sixth they sailed for the belt but after a few hours this resolution was changed and the fleet returned to its former anchorage the difficulty of the course is said to have been one of the reason nelson's advice another the next day was more idly expended in dispatching a flag of truce to the governor of cronenberg castle to ask whether he had received orders to fire at the british fleet as the admiral must consider the first gun to be a declaration of war on the part of denmark a soldier-like and becoming answer was returned to this formality the governor said that the british minister had not been sent away from copenhagen but had obtained a passport at his own demand he himself as a soldier could not meddle with politics but he was not at liberty to suffer a fleet of which the intention was not yet known to approach the guns of the castle which he had the honour to command and he requested if the british admiral should think proper to make any proposals to the king of denmark that he might be appraised of it before the fleet approached nearer during this intercourse a dane who came on board the commander's ship having occasion to express his business in writing found the pen blunt and holding it up sarcastically said if your guns are not better pointed than your pens you will make little impression on copenhagen on that day intelligence reached the admiral of the loss of one of his fleet the invincible seventy four wrecked on a sandbank as she was coming out of yarmouth four hundred of her men perishing in her nelson who was now appointed to lead the van shifted his flag to the elephant captain foley a lighter ship than the st george and therefore fitter for the expected operations the two following days were calm orders had been given to pass the sound as soon as the wind would permit 
and on the afternoon of the 29th the ships were cleared for action with an alacrity characteristic of British seamen. At daybreak on the 30th it blew a topsail breeze from the northwest. The signal was made, and the fleet moved on in order of battle. Nelson's division in the van, Sir Hyde's in the centre, and Admiral Graves in the rear. Great actions, whether military or naval, have generally given celebrity to the scenes from whence they were denominated, and thus petty villages and capes and bays, known only to the coasting trader, become associated with mighty deeds, and their names made conspicuous in the history of the world. Here, however, the scene was every way worthy of the drama. The political importance of the sound is such that grand objects are not needed there to impress the imagination, yet is the channel full of grand and interesting objects, both of art and nature. This passage, which Denmark had so long considered as the key of the Baltic, in its narrowest part, about three miles wide, and here the city of Elsinur is situated, except Copenhagen, the most flourishing of the Danish towns. Every vessel which passes lowers her tagallant sails and pays toll at Elsinur, a toll which is believed to have had its origin in the consent of the traders to that sea. Denmark taking upon itself the charge of constructing lighthouses and erecting signals to mark the shoals and rocks from the Kattegat to the Baltic, and they on their part agreeing that all ships should pass this way in order that all might pay their share, none from that time using the passage of the belt because it was not fitting that they who enjoyed the benefit of the beacons in dark and stormy weather should evade contributing to them in fair seasons and summer nights. Of late years about 10,000 vessels had annually paid this contribution in time of peace. Adjoining Elsinur, and at the edge of a peninsular promontory upon the nearest point of land to the Swedish coast, stands Cronenberg Castle built after Tycho Brahe's design, a magnificent pile, at once a palace and a fortress, and state prison, with its spires and towers and battlements and batteries. On the left of the strait is the old Swedish city of Helsingborg, at the foot and on the side of a hill. To the north of Helsingborg the shores are steep and rocky. They lower to the south and the distant spires of Landskrona, Lund, and Malmö are seen in the flat country. The Danish shores consist partly of ridges of sand, but more frequently their slopes are covered with rich wood and villages and villas denoting the vicinity of a great capital. The isles of Huen, Saltholm, and Amak appear in the widening channel, and at the distance of twenty miles from Elsinur, stands Copenhagen in full view, the best-built city of the north, and one of the finest capitals of Europe, visible with its stately spires far off. Amid these magnificent objects there are some which possess a peculiar interest for the recollections which they call forth. The Isle of Huen, a lovely domain about six miles in circumference, had been the munificent gift of Frederick the Second to Tycho Brahe. Here most of his discoveries were made, and here the ruins are to be seen of his observatory and of the mansion where he was visited by princes, and where, with a princely spirit, he received and entertained all comers from all parts, and promoted science by his liberality as well as by his labours. Elsinur is a name familiar to English ears, being inseparably associated with Hamlet, and one of the noblest works of human genius. Cronenberg had been the scene of deeper tragedy. Here Queen Matilda was confined, the victim of a foul and murderous court intrigue. Here, amid heart-breaking griefs, she found consolation in nursing her infant. Here she took her everlasting leave of that infant, when, by the interference of England, her own deliverance was obtained. 
and as the ship bore her away from a country where the venial indiscretions of youth and unsuspicious gaiety had been so cruelly punished upon these towers she fixed her eyes and stood upon the deck obstinately gazing towards them till the last speck had disappeared the sound being the only frequented entrance to the baltic the great mediterranean of the north few parts of the sea display so frequent a navigation in the height of the season not fewer than a hundred vessels pass every four and twenty hours for many weeks in succession but never had so busy or so splendid a scene been exhibited there as on this day when the british fleet prepared to force that passage where till now all ships had veiled their topsails to the flag of denmark the whole force consisted of fifty-one sail of various descriptions of which sixteen were of the line the greater part of the bomb and gun vessels took their station off cronenberg castle to cover the fleet while others on the larboard were ready to engage the swedish shore the danes having improved every moment which ill-timed negotiation and baffling weather gave them had lined their shore with batteries and as soon as the monarch which was the leading ship came abreast of them a fire was opened from about a hundred pieces of cannon and mortars our light vessels immediately in return opened their fire upon the castle here was all the pompous circumstance and exciting reality of war without its effects for this ostentatious display was but a bloodless prelude to the wide and sweeping destruction which was soon to follow the enemy's shot fell near enough to splash the water on board our ships not relying upon any forbearance of the swedes they meant to have kept the mid-channel but when they perceived that not a shot was fired from helsingberg and that no batteries were to be seen on the swedish shore they inclined to that side so as completely to get out of reach of the danish guns the uninterrupted blaze which was kept up from them till the fleet had passed served only to exhilarate our sailors and afford them matter for jest as the shot fell in showers a full cable's length short of its destined aim a few rounds were returned from some of our leading ships till they perceived its inutility this however occasioned the only bloodshed of the day some of our men being killed and wounded by the bursting of a gun as soon as the main body had passed the gun vessels followed desisting from their bombardment which had been as innocent as that of the enemy and about midday the whole fleet anchored between the island of huen and copenhagen sir hyde with nelson admiral graves some of the senior captains and the commanding officers of the artillery and the troops then proceeded in a lugger to reconnoitre the enemy's means of defence a formidable line of ships radeaus pontoons galleys fireships and gunboats flanked and supported by extensive batteries and occupying from one extreme point to the other an extent of nearly four miles a council of war was held in the afternoon it was apparent that the danes could not be attacked without great difficulty and risk and some of the members of the council spoke of the numbers of the swedes and the russians whom they should afterwards have to engage as a consideration which ought to be borne in mind nelson who kept pacing the cabin impatient as he ever was of anything which savoured of irresolution repeatedly said the more numerous the better i wish they were twice as many the easier the victory depend on it the plan upon which he had determined if ever it should be his fortune to bring a baltic fleet to action was to attack the head of their line and confuse their movements close with a frenchman he used to say but outmanoeuvre a russian he offered his services for the attack requiring ten sail of the line and the whole of the smaller craft sir hyde gave him two more line of battleships than he asked and left everything to his judgment the enemy's force was not the only nor the greatest obstacle which the british fleet had to contend there was another to be overcome before they could come in contact with it 
The channel was little known and extremely intricate. All the buoys had been removed, and the Danes considered this difficulty as almost insuperable, thinking the channel impracticable for so large a fleet. Nelson himself saw the soundings made and the buoys laid down, boating it upon this exhausting service, day and night, till it was effected. When this was done, he thanked God for having enabled him to get through this difficult part of his duty. It had worn him down, he said, and was infinitely more grievous to him than any resistance which he could experience from the enemy. At the first council of war, opinions inclined to an attack from the eastward, but the next day, the wind being southerly, after a second examination of the Danish position, it was determined to attack from the south, approaching in the manner which Nelson had suggested in his first thoughts. On the morning of the 1st of April, the whole fleet removed to an anchorage within two leagues of the town, and off the northwest end of the middle ground, a shoal lying exactly before the town, at about three quarters of a mile distance and extending along its whole sea-front. The King's Channel, where there is deep water, is between this shoal and the town, and here the Danes had arranged their line of defence, as near the shore as possible, nineteen ships and floating batteries, flanked at the end nearest the town by the Crown batteries, which were two artificial islands at the mouth of the harbour, most formidable works the larger one having, by the Danish account, sixty-six guns, but as Nelson believed, eighty-eight. The fleet having anchored, Nelson, with Rieu in the Amazon, made his last examination of the ground, and about one o'clock, returning to his own ship, threw out the signal to weigh. It was received with a shout throughout the whole division. They weighed with a light and favourable wind. The narrow channel between the island of Saltholm and the middle ground had been accurately buoyed. The small craft pointed out the course distinctly. Ryu led the way. The whole division coasted along the outer edge of the shoal, doubled its farther extremity and anchored there off Draco Point, just as the darkness closed, the headmost of the enemy's line not being more than two miles distant. The signal to prepare for action had been made early in the evening, and as his own anchor dropped, Nelson called out, I will fight them the moment I have a fair wind. It had been agreed that Sir Hyde with the remaining ships should weigh on the following morning, at the same time as Nelson, to menace the crown batteries on his side and the four ships of the line which lay at the entrance of the arsenal and to cover our own disabled ships as they came out of action. End of chapter 7, part 1「Seven, part two of the life of nelson by robert southey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian the danes meantime had not been idle no sooner did the guns of cronenberg make it known to the whole city that all negotiation was at an end that the british fleet was passing the sound and that the dispute between the two crowns must now be decided by arms than a spirit displayed itself most honourable to the danish character all ranks offered themselves to the service of their country the university furnished a corps of twelve hundred youths the flower of denmark it was one of those emergencies in which little drilling or discipline is necessary to render courage available. They had nothing to learn but how to manage the guns, and day and night were employed in practising them. When the movements of Nelson's squadron were perceived, it was known when and where the attack was to be expected, and the line of defence was manned indiscriminately by soldiers, sailors and citizens. Had not the whole attention of the Danes been directed to strengthen their own means of defence, they might most materially have annoyed the invading squadron, and, perhaps, frustrated the impending attack, 
for the British ships were crowded in an anchoring ground of little extent. It was calm, so that mortar boats might have acted against them to the utmost advantage, and they were within range of shells from a Mac Island. A few fell among them, but the enemy soon ceased to fire. It was learnt afterwards that, fortunately for the fleet, the bed of the mortar had given way, and the Danes either could not get it replaced, or in the darkness lost the direction. This was an awful night for Copenhagen, far more so than for the British fleet, where the men were accustomed to battle and victory, and had none of those objections before their eyes which render death terrible. Nelson sat down to table with a large party of his officers. He was, as he was ever wont to be, when on the eve of action, in high spirits, and drank to a leading wind, and to the success of the morrow. After supper they returned to their respective ships, except Ryu, who remained to arrange the order of battle with Nelson and Foley, and to draw up instructions. Hardy, meantime, went in a small boat to examine the channel between them and the enemy, approaching so near that he sounded round their leading ship with a pole, lest the noise of throwing the lead should discover him. The incessant fatigue of body as well as mind which Nelson had undergone during the last three days had so exhausted him that he was earnestly urged to go to his cot and his old servant, Allen, using that kind of authority which long and affectionate service entitles and enabled him to assume on such occasions, insisted upon his complying. The cot was placed on the floor, and he continued to dictate from it. About eleven, Hardy returned, and reported the practicability of the channel, and the depth of water up to the enemy's line. About one, the orders were completed and half a dozen clerks in the foremost cabin proceeded to transcribe them, Nelson frequently calling out to them from his cot to hasten their work, for the wind was becoming fair. Instead of attempting to get a few hours of sleep, he was constantly receiving reports upon this important point. At daybreak it was announced as becoming perfectly fair. The clerks finished their work about six. Nelson, who was already up, breakfasted and made signal for all captains. The land forces and five hundred seamen under Captain Fremantle and the Honourable Colonel Stuart were to storm the Crown Battery as soon as its fire should be silenced, and Ryu, whom Nelson had never seen till this expedition, but whose worth he had instantly perceived and appreciated as it deserved, had the Blanche and Alchemene frigates the Dart and Arrow sloops, and the Zephyr and Otter fireships given him, with a special command to act as circumstances might require. Every other ship had its station appointed. Between eight and nine the pilots and masters were ordered on board the Admiral's ship. The pilots were mostly men who had been mates in Baltic traders, and their hesitation about the bearing of the east end of the shoal and the exact line of deep water gave ominous warning of how little their knowledge was to be trusted. The signal for action had been made. The wind was fair, not a moment to be lost. Nelson urged them to be steady, to be resolute, and to decide. But they wanted the only ground for steadiness and decision in such cases, and Nelson had reason to regret that he had not trusted to Hardy's single report. This was one of the most painful moments of his life, and he always spoke of it with bitterness. I experienced in the sound, said he, the misery of having the honour of our country entrusted to a set of pilots who have no other thought than to keep the ships clear of danger, and their own silly heads clear of shot. Everybody knows what I must have suffered, and if any merit attaches itself to me, it was for combating the dangers of the shallows in defiance of them. At length Mr. Brierly, the master of the Bellona, declared that he was prepared to lead the fleet. His judgment was acceded by the rest. They returned to their ships, and at half-past nine the signal was made to weigh in succession. 
Captain Murray, in the Edgar, led the way. The Agamemnon was next in order. But on the first attempt to leave her anchorage, she could not weather the edge of the shoal, and Nelson had the grief to see his old ship, in which he had performed so many years' gallant service, immovably aground, at a moment when her help was so greatly required. Signal was then made for the Polyphemus, and this change in order of sailing was executed with the utmost promptitude. Yet so much delay had thus been unavoidably occasioned that the Edgar was for some time unsupported, and the Polyphemus, whose place should have been at the end of the enemy's line, where their strength was the greatest, could get no further than the beginning, owing to the difficulty of the channel. There she occupied, indeed, an efficient station, but one where her presence was less required. The Isis followed with better fortune, and took her own berth. The Bellona, Sir Thomas Boulden Thompson, kept too close on the starboard shoal, and grounded abreast of the outer ship of the enemy. This was the more vexatious, inasmuch as the wind was fair, the room ample, and three ships had led the way. The Russell following the Bellona grounded in like manner. Both were within reach of shot, but their absence from their intended stations was severely felt. Each ship had been ordered to pass her leader on the starboard side, because the water was supposed to shoal on the larboard shore. Nelson, who came next after these two ships, thought they had kept too far on the starboard direction, and made signal for them to close with the enemy, not knowing that they were aground. But when he perceived that they did not obey the signal, he ordered the elephant's helm to starboard, and went within these ships, thus quitting the appointed order of sailing, and guiding those which were to follow. The greater part of the fleet were probably by this act of promptitude on his part saved from going on shore. Each ship, as she arrived nearly opposite to her appointed station, let her anchor go by the stern, and presented her broadside to the Danes. The distance between each was about a half cable. The action was fought nearly at the distance of a cable's length from the enemy. This, which rendered its continuance so long, was owing to the ignorance and consequent indecision of the pilots. In pursuance of the same error which had led the Bellona and the Russell aground, they, when the lead was at a quarter less five, refused to approach nearer, in dread of shoaling their water on the larboard shore, a fear altogether erroneous, for the water deepened up to the very side of the enemy's line. At five minutes after ten the action began. The first half of our fleet was engaged in about half an hour, and by half past eleven the battle became general. The plan of the attack had been complete, but seldom has any plan been more disconcerted by untoward accidents. Of twelve ships of the line, one was entirely useless, and two others in a situation where they could not render half the service which was required of them. Of the squadron of gun brigs, only one could get into action. The rest were prevented by baffling currents from weathering the eastern end of the shoal, and only two of the bomb vessels could reach their station on the middle ground, and open their mortars on the arsenal, firing over both fleets. Rio took the vacant station against the Crown Battery with his frigates, attempting with that unequal force a service which three sail of the line had been directed to assist. Nelson's agitation had been extreme when he saw himself before the action began deprived of a fourth part of his ships of the line, but no sooner was he in battle, where his squadron was received with the fire of more than a thousand guns, than, as if that artillery, like music, had driven away all care and painful thoughts, his countenance brightened, and as a bystander describes him, his conversation became joyous, animated, elevated, and delightful. The commander-in-chief, meantime, near enough to the scene of action to know the unfavourable accidents which had so materially weakened Nelson, and yet too distant to know the real state of the contending parties, suffered the most dreadful anxiety. To get to his assistance was impossible, 
both wind and current were against him. Fear for the event in such circumstances would naturally preponderate in the bravest mind, and at one o'clock perceiving that after three hours endurance the enemy's fire was unslackened, he began to despair of success, and thinking it became him to save what he could from the hopeless contest, he made signal for retreat. Nelson was now in all the excitement of action, pacing the quarter-deck. A shot through the mainmast knocked the splinters about, and he observed to one of his officers, with a smile, It is warm work, and this day may be the last to any of us at the moment. And then, stopping short at the gangway, added with emotion, But mark you, I would not be elsewhere for thousands. About this time the signal lieutenant called out that number 39, the signal for discontinuing the action, was thrown out by the commander-in-chief. He continued to walk the deck, and appeared to take no notice of it. The signal officer met him at the next turn, and asked if he should repeat it. No, he replied, acknowledge it. Presently he called after him to know if the signal for close action was still hoisted, and being answered in the affirmative said, Mind you keep it so. He now paced the deck, moving the stump of his lost arm in a manner which always indicated great emotion. Do you know, said he to Mr. Ferguson, what is shown on board the Commander-in-Chief? Number 39. Mr. Ferguson asked what that meant. Why, to leave off action. Then, shrugging up his shoulders, he repeated the words, Leave off action. Now, damn me if I do. You know, Foley, turning to the captain, I have only one eye. I have a right to be blind sometimes. And then, putting the glass to his blind eye, in that mood of mind which sports with bitterness, he exclaimed, I really do not see the signal. Presently he exclaimed, Damn the signal! Keep mine for closer battle flying. That's the way I answer such signals. Nail mine to the mast. Admiral Graves, who was so situated that he could not discern what was done on board the elephant, disobeyed Sir Hyde's signal in like manner, whether by fortunate mistake, or, by a like brave intention, has not been made known. The other ships of the line, looking only to Nelson, continued the action. The signal, however, saved Ryu's little squadron, but did not save its heroic leader. This squadron, which was nearest the commander-in-chief, obeyed, and hauled off. It had suffered severely in its most unequal contest. For a long time the Amazon had been firing, enveloped in smoke. When Rio desired his men to stand fast and let the smoke clear off, that they might see what they were about, a fatal order, for the Danes then got clear sight of her from the batteries and pointed their guns with such tremendous effect that nothing but the signal for retreat saved the frigate from destruction. What will Nelson think of us was Rio's mournful exclamation when he unwillingly drew off. He had been wounded in the head by a splinter, and was sitting on a gun, encouraging his men, when just as the Amazon showed her stern to the Trekkono battery, his clerk was killed by his side, and another shot swept away several marines who were hauling in the main brace. "'Come then, my boys,' cried Ryu, "'let us all die together.' The words had scarcely been uttered before a raking shot cut him in two. Except it had been Nelson himself, the British Navy could not have suffered a severer loss. The action continued along the line with unbated vigour on our side, and with the most determined resolution on the part of the Danes. They fought to great advantage, because most of the vessels in their line of defence were without masts. The few which had any standing had their top masts struck, and the hulls could only be seen at intervals. The Isis must have been destroyed by the superior weight of her enemy's fire if Captain Inman, in the Desiree frigate, had not judiciously taken a situation which enabled him to rake the Dane, and if the Polyphemus had not also relieved her. 
both in the Bologna and the Isis, many men were lost by the bursting of their guns. The former ship was about forty years old, and these guns were believed to be the same which she had first taken to sea. They were probably originally faulty, for the fragments were full of little air holes. The Bellona lost seventy-five men, the Isis one hundred and ten, the Monarch two hundred and ten. She was, more than any other line of battleship, exposed to the great battery, and supporting at the same time the united fire of the Holstein and Zealand. Her loss this day exceeded that of any single ship during the whole war. Amid the tremendous carnage in this vessel, some of the men displayed a singular instance of coolness. The pork and peas happened to be in the kettle. A shot knocked its contents about. They picked up the pieces and ate and fought at the same time. The Prince Royal had taken his station upon one of the batteries, from whence he beheld the action and issued his orders. Denmark had never been engaged in so arduous a contest, and never did the Danes more nobly display their national courage, a courage not more unhappily than impolitically exerted in subserviency to the interests of France. Captain Thurer of the Indford Stretton fell early in the action, and all his officers, except one lieutenant and one marine officer, were either killed or wounded. In the confusion, the colours were either struck or shot away, but she was moored athwart one of the batteries in such a situation that the British made no attempt to board her, and a boat was dispatched to the Prince to inform him of her situation. He turned to those about him and said, Gentlemen, Thura is killed. Which of you will take the command? Schroeder, see. A captain who had lately resigned on account of extreme ill health answered in a feeble voice, I will, and hastened on board. The crew, perceiving a new commander coming alongside, hoisted their colours again and fired a broadside. Schroedersy, when he came on deck, found himself surrounded by the dead and wounded, and called to those in the boat to get quickly on board. A ball struck him at that moment. A lieutenant who had accompanied him then took the command, and continued to fight the ship. A youth of seventeen, by name Willemos, particularly distinguished himself on this memorable day. He had volunteered to take the command of a floating battery, which was a raft consisting merely of a number of beams nailed together with a flooring to support the guns. It was square, with a breastwork full of portholes and without masts, carrying twenty-four guns, and one hundred and twenty men. With this he got under the stern of the elephant, below the reach of the stern chasers, and under a heavy fire of small arms from the marines, fought his raft till the truce was announced, with such skill as well as courage as to excite Nelson's warmest admiration. Between one and two the fire of the Danes slackened. About two it ceased from the greater part of their line, and some of their lighter ships were adrift. It was, however, difficult to take possession of those who struck, because the batteries on Amak Island protected them, and because an irregular fire was kept up from the ships themselves as the boats approached. This arose from the nature of the action. The crews were continually reinforced from the shore, and fresh men coming on board did not inquire whether the flag had been struck, or perhaps did not heed it. Many, or most of them, never having been engaged in war before, knowing nothing therefore of its laws, and thinking only of defending their country to the last extremity. The Danbrog fired upon the elephant's boats in this manner though her commodore had removed her pennant and deserted her, though she had struck, and though she was in flames. After she had been abandoned by the commodore, Brown fought her till he lost his right hand, and then Captain Lemming took the command. This unexpected renewal of her fire made the elephant and Glatton renew theirs, till she was not only silenced, but nearly every man in the prams ahead and astern of her was killed. 
when the smoke of their guns died away, she was seen drifting in flames before the wind. Those of her crew who remained alive and able to exert themselves throwing themselves out of her portholes. Captain Roth commanded the Nyborg Pram, and perceiving that she could not much longer be kept afloat, made for the inner road. As he passed the line, he found the Agashrus Pram in a more miserable condition than his own. Her masts had all gone by the board, and she was on the point of sinking. Roth made fast a cable to her stern and towed her off, but he could get her no further than a shoal called Steuben when she sank, and soon after he had worked the nighboard up to the landing place, that vessel also sunk to a gunwale. Never did any vessel come out of action in a more dreadful plight. The stump of her foremast was the only stick standing. Her cabin had been stove in, every gun except a single one was dismounted, and her deck was covered with shattered limbs and dead bodies. By half past two the action had ceased along that part of the line which was astern the elephant, but not with the ships ahead and the crown batteries. Nelson, seeing the manner in which his boats were fired upon when they went to take possession of the prizes, became angry and said he must either send on shore to have this irregular proceeding stopped, or send a fireship and burn them. And, with the presence of mind peculiar to himself, and never more signally displayed than now, he availed himself of this occasion to secure the advantage which he had gained, and open a negotiation. He returned into the stern galley, and wrote thus to the Crown Prince. Vice Admiral Lord Nelson, has been commanded to spare Denmark when she no longer resists. The line of defence which covered her shores has struck to the British flag, but if the firing is continued on the part of Denmark, he must set on fire all the prizes that he has taken, without having the power of saving the men who have so nobly defended them. The brave Danes are the brothers and should never be the enemies of the English. A wafer was given him, but he ordered a candle to be brought from the cockpit, and sealed the letter with wax, affixing a larger seal than he ordinarily used. This, said he, is no time to appear hurried and informal. Captain Sir Frederick Thesiger, who acted as his aide-de-camp, carried this letter with a flag of truce. Meanwhile the fire of the ships ahead, and the approach of the Ramillies and defence from Sir Hyde's division, which had now worked near enough to alarm the enemy, though not to injure them, silenced the remainder of the Danish line to the eastward of the Treconneur. That battery, however, continued its fire. This formidable work, owing to the want of the ships which had been destined to attack it, and the inadequate force of Ryu's little squadron, was comparatively uninjured. Towards the close of the action it had been manned with nearly fifteen hundred men, and the intention of storming it, for which every preparation had been made, was abandoned as impracticable. End of chapter 7, part 2《of the Life of Nelson》by Robert Southey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. During Thesiger's absence, Nelson sent for Fremantle from the Ganges, and consulted with him and Foley whether it was advisable to advance with those ships which had sustained least damage against the yet uninjured part of the Danish line. They were decidedly of opinion that the best thing which could be done was, while the wind continued fair, to remove the fleet out of the intricate channel from which it had to retreat. In somewhat more than half an hour after Thesiger had been dispatched, the Danish adjutant general Lindholm came, bearing a flag of truce, upon which the Treconro ceased to fire, and the action closed after four hours' continuance. He brought an inquiry from the Prince. What was the object of Nelson's note? The British Admiral wrote in reply. 
Lord Nelson's object in sending the flag of truce was humanity. He therefore consents that hostilities shall cease, and that the wounded Danes may be taken on shore. And Lord Nelson will take his prisoners out of the vessels, and burn or carry off his prizes as he shall think fit. Lord Nelson, with humble duty to His Royal Highness, the Prince, will consider this the greatest victory he has ever gained, if it may be the cause of a happy reconciliation and union between his own most gracious Sovereign and His Majesty the King of Denmark. Sir Frederick Thesiger was dispatched a second time with the reply, and the Danish Adjutant General was referred to the Commander-in-Chief for a conference upon his overture. Lindholm, assenting to this, proceeded to the London, which was riding at anchor full four miles off, and Nelson, losing not one of the critical moments which he had thus gained, made signal for his leading ships to weigh in succession. They had the shoal to clear. They were much crippled, and their course was immediately under the guns of the Treconreur. The monarch led the way. This ship, had received six and twenty shot between wind and water. She had not a shroud standing. There was a double-headed shot in the heart of her foremast, and the slightest wind would have sent every mast over her side. Footnote. It would have been well if the fleet, before they went under the batteries, had left their spare spars moored out of the reach of shot. Many would have been saved which were destroyed lying on the booms, and the hurt done by their splinters would have been saved also. Small craft could have towed them up when they were required, and after such an action so many must necessarily be wanted, that if those which were not in use were wounded, it might thus have been rendered impossible to refit the ships. End of footnote. The imminent danger from which Nelson had extricated himself soon became apparent. The monarch touched immediately upon a shoal over which she was pushed by the Ganges, taking her amidships. The Glatton went clear, but the other two, the Defiance and the Elephant, grounded about a mile from the Treconneur, and there remained fixed for many hours in spite of all the exertions of their wearied crews. The Desire frigate, also, at the other end of the line, having gone towards the close of the action to assist the Bellona, became fast on the same shoal. Nelson left the elephant soon after she took the ground to follow Lindholm. The heat of action was over, and that kind of feeling which the surrounding scene of havoc was so well fitted to produce pressed heavily upon his exhausted spirits. The sky had suddenly become overcast. White flags were waving from the mastheads of so many shattered ships. The slaughter had ceased, but the grief was to come, for the account of the dead was not yet made up, and no man could tell for what friends he might have to mourn. The very silence which follows the cessation of such a battle becomes a weight upon the heart at first, rather than a relief and though the work of mutual destruction was at an end, the Danbrog was at this time drifting about in flames. Presently she blew up, while our boats, which had put off in all directions to assist her, were endeavouring to rescue her devoted crew, few of whom could be saved. The fate of these men, after the gallantry which they had displayed, particularly affected Nelson, for there was nothing in this action of the indignation against the enemy, and the impression of the retributive justice which at the Nile had given a sterner temper to his mind, and a sense of austere delight in beholding the vengeance of which he was the appointed minister. The Danes were an honourable foe. They were of English mould as well as English blood, and now that the battle had ceased, he regarded them rather as brethren than as enemies. There was another reflection also which mingled with these melancholy thoughts, and predisposed him to receive them. He was not here master of his own movements, as at Egypt. He had won the day by disobeying his orders, and, in so far as he had been successful, had convicted the commander-in-chief of an error in judgment. 
Well, said he, as he left the elephant, I have fought contrary to orders, and I shall, perhaps, be hanged. Never mind, let them. This was the language of a man who, while he is giving utterance to an uneasy thought, clothes it half in jest, because he half repents that it has been disclosed. His services had been too eminent on that day, his judgment too conspicuous, his success too signal, for any commander, however jealous of his own authority or envious of another's merits, to express anything but satisfaction and gratitude, which Sir Hyde heartily felt, and sincerely expressed. It was speedily agreed that there should be a suspension of hostilities for four and twenty hours, that all the prizes should be surrendered and the wounded Danes carried on shore. There was a pressing necessity for this, for the Danes, either from too much confidence in the strength of their position and the difficulty of the channel, or supposing that the wounded might be carried to shore during the action, which was found totally impracticable, or perhaps from the confusion which the attack excited, had provided no surgeons, so that when our men boarded the captured ships, they found many of the mangled and mutilated Danes bleeding to death for want of proper assistance, a scene of all others the most shocking to a brave man's feelings. The boats of Sir Hyde's division were actively employed all night in bringing out the prizes, and in getting afloat the ships which were on shore. At daybreak, Nelson, who had slept in his own ship, the St. George, rode to the Elephant, and his delight in finding her afloat seemed to give him new life. There he took a hasty breakfast, praising the men for their exertions, and then pushing off to the prizes which had not yet been removed. The Zealand, 74, the last which struck, had drifted on the shoal under the trek on her, and relying as it seems upon the protection which that battery might have afforded, refused to acknowledge herself captured, saying that though it was true her flag was not to be seen, her pendant was still flying. Nelson ordered one of our brigs and three longboats to approach her, and rode up himself to one of the enemy's ships to communicate with the Commodore. This officer proved to be an old acquaintance whom he had known in the West Indies, so he invited himself on board, and, with that urbanity as well as decision which always characterised him, urged his claim to the Zealand so well that it was admitted. The men from the boats lashed a cable round her bowsprit, and the gun-vessel towed her away. It is affirmed, and probably with truth, that the Danes felt more pain at beholding this than at all their misfortunes on the preceding day, and one of the officers, Commodore Steen Bille, went to the Trekoner battery and asked the commander why he had not sunk the Zealand rather than suffer her thus to be carried off by the enemy. This was indeed a mournful day for Copenhagen. It was Good Friday, but the general agitation and the mourning which was in every house made all distinction of days be forgotten. There were, at that hour, thousands in that city who felt, and more perhaps who needed, the consolations of Christianity, but few or none who could be calm enough to think of its observances. The English were actively employed in refitting their own ships, securing the prizes, and distributing the prisoners. The Danes, in carrying on shore and disposing of the wounded and the dead. It had been a murderous action. Our loss, in killed and wounded, was 953. Part of this slaughter might have been spared. The commanding officer of the troops on board one of our ships asked where his men should be stationed. He was told that they could be of no use, that they were not near enough for musketry, and were not wanted at the guns. They had therefore better go below. This, he said, was impossible. It would be a disgrace and could never be wiped away. They were therefore drawn up on the gangway to satisfy this cruel point of honour, and there, without the possibility of annoying the enemy, they were mown down. The loss of the Danes, including prisoners, amounted to about six thousand. 
The negotiations, meantime, went on, and it was agreed that Nelson should have an interview with the Prince the following day. Hardy and Fremantle landed with him. This was a thing as unexampled as the other circumstances of the battle. A strong guard was appointed to escort him to the palace, as much for the purpose of security as of honour. The populace, according to the British account, showed a mixture of admiration, curiosity and displeasure at beholding that man in the midst of them who had inflicted such wounds upon Denmark. But there were neither acclamations nor murmurings. The people, says a Dane, did not degrade themselves with the former nor disgrace themselves with the latter. The admiral was received as one brave enemy ever ought to receive another. He was received with respect. The preliminaries of the negotiation were adjusted at this interview. During the repast which followed, Nelson, with all the sincerity of his character, bore willing testimony to the valour of his foes. He told the prince that he had been in a hundred and five engagements, but this was the most tremendous of all. The French, he said, fought bravely, but they could not have stood for one hour the fight which the Danes had supported for four. He requested that Villemos might be introduced to him, and shaking hands with the youth, told the prince that he ought to be made an admiral. The prince replied, If, my lord, I am to make all my brave officers admirals, I should have no captains or lieutenants in my service. The sympathy of the Danes for their countrymen who had bled in their defence was not weakened by the distance of time or place in this instance. Things needful for the service or the comfort of the wounded were sent in profusion to the hospitals, till the superintendents gave public notice that they could receive no more. On the third day after the action, the dead were buried in the naval churchyard. The ceremony was made as public and as solemn as the occasion required. Such a procession had never before been seen in that or perhaps in any other city. A public monument was erected upon the spot where the slain were gathered together. A subscription was opened on the day of the funeral for the relief of the sufferers, and collections in aid of it made throughout all the churches in the kingdom. This appeal to the feelings of the people was made with circumstances which gave it full effect. A monument was raised in the midst of the church, surmounted by the Danish colours. Young maidens, dressed in white, stood round it, with either one who had been wounded in the battle, or the widow and orphans of someone who had fallen. A suitable oration was delivered from the pulpit, and patriotic hymns and songs were afterwards performed. Medals were distributed to all the officers and to the men who had distinguished themselves. Poets and painters vied with each other in celebrating a battle which, disastrous as it was, had yet been honourable to their country. Some, with pardonable sophistry, represented the advantage of the day as on their own side. One writer discovered a more curious but less disputable ground of satisfaction in the reflection that Nelson, as may be inferred from his name, was of Danish descent and his actions, therefore, the Dane argued, were attributable to Danish valour. The negotiation was continued during the five following days, and in that interval the prizes were disposed of in a manner which was little approved by Nelson. Six line of battleships and eight prams had been taken. Of these, the Holstein, 64, was the only one which was sent home. The Zealand was a finer ship, but the Zealand and all the others were burnt, and their brass battering cannon sunk with the hulls in such shoal water that when the fleet returned from Revel they found the Danes with craft over the wrecks, employed in getting the guns up again. Nelson, though he forbore from any public expression of displeasure at seeing the proofs and trophies of his victory destroyed, did not forget to represent to the Admiralty the case of those who were thus deprived of their prize money. 
whether said he to earl st vincent sir hyde parker may mention the subject to you i know not for he is rich and does not want it nor is it you will believe me any desire to get a few hundred pounds that actuates me to address this letter to you but justice to the brave officers and men who fought on that day it is true our opponents were in hulks and floats only adapted for the position they were in but that made our battle so much the harder and victory so much the more difficult to obtain believe me i have weighed all circumstances and in my conscience i think that the king should send a gracious message to the house of commons for a gift to this fleet for what must be the natural feelings of the officers and men belonging to it to see their rich commander-in-chief burn all the fruits of their victory which if fitted up and sent to england as many of them might have been by dismantling part of our fleet would have sold for a good round sum on the ninth nelson landed again to conclude the terms of the armistice during its continuance the armed ships and vessels of denmark were to remain in their then actual situation as to armament equipment and hostile position and the treaty of armed neutrality as far as related to the cooperation of denmark was suspended the prisoners were to be sent on shore an acknowledgment being given for them and for the wounded also that they might be carried to great britain's credit in the account of war in case hostilities should be renewed the british fleet was allowed to provide itself with all things requisite for the health and comfort of its men a difficulty arose respecting the duration of the armistice the danish commissioners fairly stated their fears of russia and nelson with that frankness which sound policy and the sense of power seem often to require as well as justify in diplomacy told them his reasoning for demanding a long term was that he might have time to act against the russian fleet and then return to copenhagen neither party would yield upon this point and one of the danes hinted at the renewal of hostilities renew hostilities cried nelson to one of his friends for he understood french enough to comprehend what was said though not to answer it in the same language tell him we are ready at the moment ready to bombard this very night the conference however proceeded amicably on both sides and as the commissioners could not agree upon this head they broke up leaving nelson to settle it with the prince a levee was held forthwith in one of the state rooms a scene well suited for such a consultation for all these rooms had been stripped of their furniture in fear of a bombardment to a bombardment also nelson was looking at this time fatigue and anxiety and vexation at the dilatory measures of the commander-in-chief combined to make him irritable and as he was on the way to the prince's dining-room he whispered to the officer on whose arm he was leaning though i have only one eye i can see that all this will burn well after dinner he was closeted with the prince and they agreed that the armistice should continue fourteen weeks and that at its termination fourteen days notice should be given before the recommencement of hostilities an official account of the battle was published by olfert fischer the danish commander-in-chief in which it was asserted that our force was greatly superior nevertheless that two of our ships of the line had struck that the others were so weakened and especially lord nelson's own ship as to fire only single shots for an hour before the end of the action and that this hero himself in the middle and very heat of the conflict sent a flag of truce on shore to propose a cessation of hostilities for the truth of this account the dane appealed to the prince and all those who like him had been eye-witnesses of the scene nelson was exceedingly indignant at such a statement and addressed a letter in confutation of it to the adjutant-general lindholm thinking this incumbent upon himself for the information of the prince since his royal highness had been appealed to as a witness 
Otherwise, said he, had Commodore Fisher confined himself to his own veracity, I should have treated his official letter with the contempt it deserved, and allowed the world to appreciate the merits of the two contending officers. After detecting and pointing out some of the misstatements in the account, he proceeds. As to his nonsense about victory, His Royal Highness will not much credit him. I sunk, burnt, captured, or drove into the harbour, the whole line of defence to the southward of the Crown Islands. He says he is told the two British ships struck. Why did he not take possession of them? I took possession of his as fast as they struck. The reason is clear, that he did not believe it. He must have known the falsity of the report. He states that the ship in which I had the honour to hoist my flag fired latterly only single guns. It is true, for steady and cool were my brave fellows, and did not wish to throw away a single shot. He seems to exult that I sent on shore a flag of truce. You know, and His Royal Highness knows, that the guns fired from the shore could only fire through the Danish ships which had surrendered and that if I fired at the shore, it could only be in the same manner. God forbid that I should destroy an unresisting Dane. When they became my prisoners, I became their protector. This letter was written in terms of great asperity against the Danish commander. Lindholm replied in a manner every way honourable to himself. He vindicated the Commodore in some points, and excused him in others, reminding Nelson that every commander-in-chief was liable to receive incorrect reports. With a natural desire to represent the action in the most favourable light to Denmark, he took into the comparative strength of the two parties the ships which were aground, and which could not get into action, and omitted the Treconneur and the batteries upon Amak Island. He disclaimed all idea of claiming, as a victory, what to every intent and purpose, said he, was a defeat, but not an inglorious one. As to your lordship's motive for sending a flag of truce, it never can be misconstrued, and your subsequent conduct has sufficiently shown that humanity is always the companion of true valour. You have done more. You have shown yourself a friend to the re-establishment of peace and good harmony between this country and Great Britain. It is, therefore, with the sincerest esteem I shall always feel myself attached to your lordship. Thus handsomely winding up his reply, he soothed and contented Nelson, who drawing up a memorandum of the comparative force of the two parties for his own satisfaction, assured Lindholm that if the Commodore's statement had been in the same manly and honourable strain, he would have been the last man to have noticed any little inaccuracies which might get into a Commander-in-Chief's public letter. For the Battle of Copenhagen, Nelson was raised to the rank of Viscount, an inadequate mark of reward for services so splendid, and of such paramount importance to the dearest interests of England. There was, however, some prudence in dealing out honours to him step by step. Had he lived long enough, he would have fought his way up to a dukedom. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 Part 1 of The Life of Nelson by Robert Southey – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian Sir Hyde Parker is recalled, and Nelson appointed commander. He goes to revel. Settlement of affairs in the Baltic. Unsuccessful attempt upon the flotilla at Boulogne. Peace of Amiens. Nelson takes the command in the Mediterranean on the renewal of the war. Escape of the Toulon fleet. Nelson chases them to the West Indies and back, delivers up his squadron to Admiral Cornwallis, and lands in England. When Nelson informed Earl St. Vincent that the armistice had been concluded, he told him also, without reserve, 
his own discontent at the dilatoriness and indecision which he witnessed, and could not remedy. No man, said he, but those who are on the spot, can tell what I have gone through and do suffer. I make no scruple in saying that I would have been at Revel fourteen days ago, that without this armistice the fleet would never have gone, but by order of the Admiralty, and with it, I dare say, we shall not go this week. I wanted Sir Hyde to let me at least go and cruise off Karlskrona to prevent the Revel ships from getting in. I said I would not go to Revel to take any of those laurels which I was sure he would reap there. Think for me, my dear lord, and if I have deserved well, let me return. If ill, for heaven's sake supersede me, for I cannot exist in this state. Fatigue, incessant anxiety, and a climate little suited to one of a tender constitution, which had now for many years been accustomed to more genial latitudes, made him, at this time, seriously determine upon returning home. If the northern business were not settled, he said, they must send more admirals, for the keen air of the north had cut him to the heart. He felt the want of activity and decision in the commander-in-chief more keenly, and this affected his spirits, and consequently his health, more than the inclemency of the Baltic. Soon after the armistice was signed, Sir Hyde proceeded to the eastward with such ships as were fit for service, leaving Nelson to follow with the rest as soon as those which had received slight damage could be repaired and the rest sent to England. In passing between the isles of Amak and Saltholm, most of the ships touched the ground, and some of them stuck fast for a while. No serious injury, however, was sustained. It was intended to act against the Russians first, before the breaking up of the frost should enable them to leave Revel. But learning on the way that the Swedes had put to sea to effect a junction with them, Sir Hyde altered his course, in hopes of intercepting this part of the enemy's force. Nelson had, at this time, provided for the more pressing emergencies of the service, and prepared on the 18th to follow the fleet. The St. George drew too much water to pass the channel between the isles without being lightened. The guns were therefore taken out and put on board an American vessel. A contrary wind, however, prevented Nelson from moving, and on that same evening, while he was thus delayed, information reached him of the relative situation of the Swedish and British fleets, and the probability of an action. The fleet was nearly ten leagues distant, and both wind and current contrary, but it was not possible that Nelson could wait for a favourable season under such an expectation. He ordered his boat immediately and stepped into it. Night was setting in, one of the cold spring nights of the north, and it was discovered soon after they had left the ship that in their haste they had forgotten to provide him with a boat cloak. He, however, forbade them to return for one, and when one of his companions offered his own great coat and urged him to make use of it, he replied, I thank you very much, but to tell you the truth, my anxiety keeps me sufficiently warm at present. Do you think, said he presently, that our fleet has quitted Bornholm? If it has, we must follow it to Karlskrona. About midnight he reached it, and once more got on board the elephant. On the following morning the Swedes were discovered, but they, as soon as they perceived the English approaching, retired, and took shelter in Karlskrona behind the batteries on the island, at the entrance of that port. Sir Hyde sent in a flag of truce, stating that Denmark had concluded an armistice, and requiring an explicit declaration from the court of Sweden whether it would adhere to or abandon the hostile measures which it had taken against the rights and interests of Great Britain. The commander, Vice Admiral Kronstadt, replied that he could not answer a question which did not come within the particular circle of his duty 
but that the king was then at Malmo, and would soon be at Karlskrona. Gustavus shortly afterwards arrived, and an answer was then returned to this effect, that his Swedish majesty would not for a moment fail to fulfil with fidelity and sincerity the engagements he had entered into with his allies, but he would not refuse to listen to equitable proposals, made by deputies furnished with proper authority by the King of Great Britain to the United Northern Powers. Satisfied with this answer, and with the known disposition of the Swedish court, Sir Hyde sailed for the Gulf of Finland, but he had not proceeded far before a dispatch boat from the Russian ambassador at Copenhagen arrived bringing intelligence of the death of the Emperor Paul, and that his successor, Alexander, had accepted the offer made by England to his father of terminating the dispute by a convention. The British Admiral was, therefore, required to desist from all further hostilities. It was Nelson's maxim that, to negotiate with effect, force should be at hand and in a situation to act. The fleet, having been reinforced from England, amounted to eighteen sail of the line, and the wind was fair for revel. There he would have sailed immediately, to place himself between that division of the Russian fleet and the squadron at Kronstadt, in case this offer should prove insincere. Sir Hyde, on the other hand, believed that the death of Paul had effected all which was necessary. The manner of that death, indeed, rendered it apparent that a change of policy would take place in the cabinet of Petersburg. But Nelson never trusted anything to the uncertain events of time which could possibly be secured by promptitude or resolution. It was not, therefore, without severe mortification that he saw the commander-in-chief return to the coast of Zealand and anchor in Kyoge Bay, there to wait patiently for what might happen. There the fleet remained till dispatches arrived from home on the 5th of May, recalling Sir Hyde and appointing Nelson commander-in-chief. Nelson wrote to Earl St. Vincent that he was unable to hold this honourable station. Admiral Graves also was so ill as to be confined to his bed, and he entreated that some person might come out and take the command. I will endeavour, said he, to do my best while I remain, but my dear lord, I shall either soon go to heaven, I hope, or must rest quiet for a time. If Sir Hyde were gone, I would now be under sail. On the day when this was written, he received news of his appointment. Not a moment was now lost. His first signal, as commander-in-chief, was to hoist in all launches and prepare to weigh. And on the seventh he sailed from Kyoge. Part of his fleet was left at Bornholm to watch the Swedes, from whom he required and obtained an assurance that the British trade in the Kattegat and in the Baltic should not be molested, and saying how unpleasant it would be to him if anything should happen which might, for a moment, disturb the returning harmony between Sweden and Great Britain. He apprised them that he was not directed to abstain from hostilities should he meet with the Swedish fleet at sea. Meantime, he himself, with ten sail of the line, two frigates, a brig, and a schooner, made for the Gulf of Finland. Paul, in one of the freaks of his tyranny, had seized upon all British effects in Russia, and even considered British subjects as his prisoners. I will have all the English shipping and property restored, said Nelson, but I will do nothing violently, neither commit my country nor suffer Russia to mix the affairs of Denmark or Sweden with the detention of our ships. The wind was fair and carried him in four days to Revel Roads, but the bay had been clear of firm ice on the 29th of April, while the English were lying idly at Kyoge. The Russians had cut through the ice in the mole, six feet thick, and their whole squadron had sailed for Kronstadt on the third. Before that time it had lain at the mercy of the English. 
Nothing, Nelson said, if it had been right to make the attack, would have saved one ship of them in two hours after our entering the bay. It so happened that there was no cause to regret the opportunity which had been lost, and Nelson immediately put the intentions of Russia to the proof. He sent on shore to say that he came with friendly views, and was ready to return a salute. On their part, the salute was delayed till a message was sent to them to inquire for what reason, and the officer, whose neglect had occasioned the delay, was put under arrest. Nelson wrote to the Emperor, proposing to wait on him personally, and congratulate him on his accession, and urging the immediate release of British subjects and restoration of British property. The answer arrived on the 16th. Nelson, meantime, had exchanged visits with the governor, and the most friendly intercourse had subsisted between the ships and the shore. Alexander's ministers, in their reply, expressed their surprise at the arrival of a British fleet in a Russian port, and their wish that it should return. They professed, on the part of Russia, the most friendly disposition towards Great Britain, but declined the personal visit of Lord Nelson, unless he came in a single ship. There was a suspicion implied in this which stung Nelson, and he said the Russian ministers would never have written thus if their fleet had been at revel. He wrote an immediate reply, expressing what he felt. He told the court of Petersburg that the word of a British admiral, when given in explanation of any part of his conduct, was as sacred as that of any sovereign in Europe. And he repeated, that under other circumstances it would have been his anxious wish to have paid his personal respects to the Emperor, and signed, with his own hand, the act of amity between the two countries. Having dispatched this, he stood out to sea immediately, leaving a brig to bring off the provisions which had been contracted for, and to settle the accounts. I hope all is right, said he, writing to our ambassador at Berlin. But seamen are bad negotiators, for we put to issue in five minutes what diplomatic forms would be five months doing. On his way down the Baltic, however, he met the Russian admiral Chichagov, whom the emperor, in reply to Sir Hyde's overtures, had sent to communicate personally with the British commander-in-chief. The reply was such as had been wished and expected and these negotiators, going seamanlike, straight to their object, satisfied each other of the friendly intentions of their respective governments. Nelson then anchored off Rostock, and there he received an answer to his last dispatch from Revel, in which the Russian court expressed their regret that there should have been any misconception between them, informed him that the British vessels which Paul had detained were ordered to be liberated, and invited him to Petersburg in whatever mode might be most agreeable to himself. Other honours awaited him. The Duke of mecklenburg strelitz the Queen's brother, came to visit him on board his ship, and towns from the inland parts of Mecklenburg sent deputations with their public books of record that they might have the name of Nelson in them written by his own hand. From Rostock the fleet returned to Kyoge Bay. Nelson saw that the temper of the Danes towards England was such as naturally arose from the chastisement which they had so recently received. In this nation, said he, we shall not be forgiven for having the upper hand of them. I only thank God we have, or they would try to humble us to the dust. He saw also that the Danish cabinet was completely subservient to France. A French officer was at this time the companion and counsellor of the Crown Prince, and things were done in such open violation of the armistice that Nelson thought a second infliction of vengeance would soon be necessary. He wrote to the Admiralty requesting a clear and explicit reply to his inquiry, whether the Commander-in-Chief was at liberty to hold the language becoming a British Admiral, which very probably, said he, if I am here, will break the armistice, and set Copenhagen in a blaze. I see everything which is dirty and mean going on, and the Prince Royal at the head of it. 
ships have been mastered, guns taken on board, floating batteries prepared, and except hauling out and completing their rigging, everything has been done in defiance of the treaty. My heart burns at seeing the word of a prince, nearly allied to our own good king, so falsified, but his conduct is such that he will lose his kingdom if he goes on, for Jacobin's rule in Denmark. I have made no representations yet, as it would be useless to do so until I have the power of correction. All I beg, in the name of the future Commander-in-Chief, is that the orders may be clear, for enough is done to break twenty treaties, if it should be wished, or to make the Prince Royal humble himself before British generosity. Nelson was not deceived in his judgment of the Danish cabinet but the Battle of Copenhagen had crippled its power. The death of the Tsar Paul had broken the Confederacy, and that cabinet therefore was compelled to defer till a more convenient season the indulgence of its enmity towards Great Britain. Soon afterwards, Admiral Sir Charles Morris Pole arrived to take the command. The business, military and political, had by that time been so far completed that the presence of the British fleet soon became no longer necessary. Sir Charles, however, made the short time of his command memorable by passing the great belt for the first time with line of battle ships working through the channel against adverse winds. When Nelson left the fleet, his speedy termination of the expedition, though confidentially expected, was not certain and he, in his unwillingness to weaken the British force, thought at one time of traversing Jutland in his boat by the canal to Toningen on the Ida, and finding his way home from thence. This intention was not executed, but he returned in a brig, declining to accept a frigate, which few admirals would have done, especially if, like him, they suffered from seasickness in a small vessel. On his arrival at Yarmouth, the first thing he did was to visit the hospital and see the men who had been wounded in the late battle. That victory which had added new glory to the name of Nelson, and which was of more importance even than the Battle of the Nile, to the honour and strength and security of England. He had not been many weeks on shore before he was called upon to undertake a service for which no Nelson was required. Bonaparte, who was now first consul, and in reality sole ruler of France, was making preparations upon a great scale for invading England. But his schemes in the Baltic had been baffled. Fleets could not be created as they were wanted, and his armies, therefore, were to come over in gunboats, and such small craft as could be rapidly built or collected for the occasion. From the former governments of France, such threats have only been matters of insult and policy. In Bonaparte they were sincere, for this adventurer, intoxicated with success, already began to imagine that all things were to be submitted to his fortune. We had not, at that time, proved the superiority of our soldiers over the French and the unreflecting multitude were not to be persuaded that an invasion could only be effected by numerous and powerful fleets. A general alarm was excited, and in condescension to this unworthy feeling, Nelson was appointed to a command extending from Orfordness to Beachy Head, on both shores, a sort of service, he said, for which he felt no other ability than what might be found in his zeal. To this service, however, such as it was, he applied with his wonted alacrity, and having hoisted his flag in the Medusa frigate, went to reconnoitre Boulogne, the point from which it was supposed the great attempt would be made, and which the French, in fear of an attack themselves, were fortifying with all care. He approached near enough to sink two of their floating batteries, and destroy a few gunboats which were without the pier. What damage was done within could not be ascertained. Boulogne, he said, was certainly not a very pleasant place that morning, but, he added, it is not my wish to injure the poor inhabitants, 
and the town is spared as much as the nature of the service will admit. Enough was done to show the enemy that they could not with impunity come outside their own ports. Nelson was satisfied by what he saw that they meant to make an attempt from this place, but that it was impracticable, for the least wind at west-north-west, and they were lost. The ports of Flushing and Flanders were better points. There we could not tell by our own eyes what means of transport were provided. From thence, therefore, if it came forth at all, the expedition would come. And what a forlorn undertaking, said he. Consider cross tides, etc. As for rowing, that is impossible. It is perfectly right to be prepared for a mad government, but with the active force which has been given me, I may pronounce it almost impracticable. That force had been got together with an alacrity which has seldom been equalled. On the 28th of July, we were, in Nelson's own words, literally at the foundation of our fabric of defence, and twelve days afterwards we were so prepared on the enemy's coast that he did not believe they could get three miles from their ports. The Medusa, returning to our own shores, anchored in the rolling ground off Harwich, and when Nelson wished to get to the Nore in her, the wind rendered it impossible to proceed there by the usual channel. In haste to be at the Nore, remembering that he had been a tolerable pilot for the mouth of the Thames in his younger days, and thinking it necessary that he should know all that could be known of the navigation, he requested the maritime surveyor of the coast, Mr. Spence, to get him into the Swin by any channel for neither the pilots which he had on board nor the Harwich ones could take charge of the ship. No vessel drawing more than fourteen feet had ever before ventured over the Nays. Mr. Spence, however, who had surveyed the channel, carried her safely through. The channel has since been called Nelson's, though he himself wished it to be named after the Medusa. His name needed no new memorial. Nelson's eye was upon Flushing. To take possession of that place, he said, would be a week's expedition for four or five thousand troops. This, however, required a consultation with the Admiralty, and that something might be done meantime, he resolved upon attacking the flotilla in the mouth of Boulogne Harbour, owning at the same time that this boat warfare was not exactly congenial to his feelings. Into Helvoet or Flushing he would be happy to lead if government turned their thoughts that way. While I serve, said he, I will do it actively and to the very best of my abilities. I require nursing like a child, he added. My mind carries me beyond my strength and will do me up, but such is my nature. The attack was made by the boats of the squadron in five divisions, under Captains Somerville, Parker, Cotgrave, Jones and Conn. The previous essay had taught the French the weak parts of their position, and they had omitted no means of strengthening it and of guarding against the expected attempt. The boats put off about half an hour before midnight. But owing to the darkness and the tide, and half-tide, which must always make night attacks so uncertain on the coasts of the channel, the divisions separated. One could not arrive at all, another not till near daybreak. The others made their attack gallantly, but the enemy were fully prepared. Every vessel was defended by long poles, headed with iron spikes projecting from their sides. Strong nettings were braced up to their lower yards. They were moored by the bottom to the shore, and chained one to another. They were strongly manned with soldiers, and protected by land batteries, and the shore was lined with troops. Many were taken possession of, and though they could not have been brought out, would have been burnt, had not the French resorted to a mode of offence which they have often used, but which no other people have ever been wicked enough to employ. The moment the firing ceased on board one of their own vessels, they fired upon it from the shore, perfectly regardless of their own men. 
the commander of one of the french divisions acted like a generous enemy he hailed the boats as they approached and cried out in english let me advise you my brave englishman to keep your distance you can do nothing here and it is only uselessly shedding the blood of brave men to make the attempt the french official account boasted of the victory the combat it said took place in sight of both countries it was the first of the kind and the historian would have cause to make this remark they guessed our loss at four or five hundred it amounted to one hundred and seventy two in his private letters to the admiralty nelson affirmed that had our force arrived as he intended it was not all the chains in france which could have prevented our men from bringing off the whole of the vessels there had been no error committed and never did englishmen display more courage upon this point nelson was fully satisfied but he said he should never bring himself again to allow any attack wherein he was not personally concerned and that his mind suffered more than if he had had a leg shot off in the affair he grieved particularly for captain parker an excellent officer to whom he was greatly attached and who had an aged father looking to him for assistance his thigh was shattered in the action and the wound proved mortal after some weeks of suffering and manly resignation during this interval nelson's anxiety was very great dear parker is my child said he for i found him in distress and when he received the tidings of his death he replied you will judge of my feelings god's will be done i beg that his hair may be cut off and given me it shall be buried in my grave poor mr parker what a son he has lost if i were to say i was content i should lie but i shall endeavour to submit with all the fortitude in my power his loss has made a wound in my heart which time will hardly heal he now wished to be relieved from this service the country he said had attached a confidence to his name which he had submitted to and therefore had cheerfully repaired to the station but this boat business though it might be part of a great plan of invasion could never be the only one and he did not think it was a command for a vice-admiral it was not that he wanted a more lucrative situation for seriously indisposed as he was and low-spirited from private considerations he did not know if the mediterranean were vacant that he should be equal to undertake it just at this time the peace of amiens was signed nelson rejoiced that the experiment was made but was well aware that it was an experiment he saw what he called the misery of peace unless the utmost vigilance and prudence were exerted and he expressed in bitter terms his proper indignation at the manner in which the mob of london welcomed the french general who brought the ratification saying that they made him ashamed of his country End of chapter eight part one Chapter Eight, Part Two of the Life of Nelson by Robert Southey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. He had purchased a house and estate at Merton in Surrey, meaning to pass his days there in the society of Sir William and Lady Hamilton. This place he had never seen till he was now welcomed there by the friends to whom he had so passionately devoted himself, and who were not less sincerely attached to him. The place, and everything which Lady Hamilton had done to it, delighted him, and he declared that the longest liver should possess it all. The depression of spirits under which he had long laboured arose from the disquietude in which this connection had involved him a connection which it was not possible his father could behold without sorrow and displeasure. Mr. Nelson, however, was soon convinced that the attachment which Lady Nelson regarded with natural jealousy and resentment 
did not in reality pass the bounds of ardent and romantic admiration a passion which the manners and accomplishments of lady hamilton fascinating as they were would not have been able to excite if they had not been accompanied by more uncommon intellectual endowments and by a character which both in its strength and in its weakness resembled his own it did not therefore require much explanation to reconcile him to his son an event the more essential to nelson's happiness because a few months afterwards the good old man died at the age of seventy-nine soon after the conclusion of peace tidings arrived of our final and decisive successes in egypt in consequence of which the common council voted their thanks to the army and navy for bringing the campaign to so glorious a conclusion when nelson after the action of cape st vincent had been entertained at a city feast he had observed to the lord mayor that if the city continued its generosity the navy would ruin them in gifts to which the lord mayor replied putting his hand upon the admiral's shoulder do you find victories and we will find rewards nelson as he said had kept his word and doubly fulfilled his part of the contract but no thanks had been voted for the battle of copenhagen and feeling that he and his companions in that day's glory had a fair and honourable claim to this reward he took the present opportunity of addressing a letter to the lord mayor complaining of the omission and the injustice the smallest service said he rendered by the army or navy to the country have been always noticed by the great city of london with one exception the glorious second of april a day when the greatest dangers of navigation were overcome and the danish force which they thought impregnable totally taken or destroyed by the consummate skill of our commanders and by the undaunted bravery of as gallant a band as ever defended the rights of this country for myself if i were only personally concerned i should bear the stigma attempted to be now first placed upon my brow with humility but my lord i am the natural guardian of the fame of the officers of the navy army and marines who fought and so profusely bled under my command on that day again i disclaim for myself more merit than naturally falls to a successful commander but when i am called upon to speak of the merits of the captains of his majesty's ships and of the officers and men whether seamen marines or soldiers whom i had that day the happiness to command i say then that never was the glory of this country upheld with more determined bravery than on that occasion and if i may be allowed to give an opinion as a briton then i say that more important service was never rendered to our king and country it is my duty my lord to prove to the brave fellows my companions in danger that i have not failed at every proper place to represent as well as i am able their bravery and meritorious conduct another honour of greater import was withheld from the conquerors the king had given medals to those captains who were engaged in the battles of the first of june of cape st vincent of camperdown and of the nile then came the victory at copenhagen which nelson truly called the most difficult achievement the hardest fought battle the most glorious result that ever graced the annals of our country he of course expected the medal and in writing to earl st vincent said he longed to have it and would not give it up to be made an english duke the medal however was not given for what reason said nelson lord st vincent best knows words plainly implying a suspicion that it was withheld by some feeling of jealousy and that suspicion estranged him during the remaining part of his life from one who had at one time been essentially as well as sincerely his friend and of whose professional abilities he ever entertained the highest opinion the happiness which nelson enjoyed in the society of his chosen friends was of no long continuance 
Sir William Hamilton, who was far advanced in years, died early in 1803. He expired in his wife's arms, holding Nelson by the hand, and almost in his last words left her to his protection, requesting him that he would see justice done her by the government, as he knew what she had done for her country. He left him her portrait in enamel, calling him his dearest friend, the most virtuous, loyal, and truly brave character he had ever known. The codicil containing this bequest concluded with these words, God bless him, and shame fall on those who do not say Amen. Sir William's pension of £1,200 a year ceased with his death. Nelson applied to Mr. Addington in Lady Hamilton's behalf, stating the important service which she had rendered to the fleet at Syracuse, and Mr. Addington, it is said, acknowledged that she had a just claim upon the gratitude of the country. This barren acknowledgment was all that was obtained, but a sum equal to the pension which her husband had enjoyed was settled on her by Nelson and paid in monthly payments during his life. A few weeks after this event, the war was renewed, and the day after His Majesty's message to Parliament, Nelson departed to take the command of the Mediterranean fleet. He took his station immediately off Toulon, and there, with incessant vigilance, waited for the coming out of the enemy. When he had been fourteen months thus employed, he received a vote of thanks from the City of London for his skill and perseverance in blockading that port so as to prevent the French from putting to sea. Nelson had not forgotten the wrong which the city had done to the Baltic fleet by their admission, and did not lose the opportunity which this vote afforded of recurring to that point. I do assure your lordship, said he in his answer to the Lord Mayor, that there is not that man breathing who sets a higher value upon the thanks of his fellow citizens of London than myself. But I should feel as much ashamed to receive them for a particular service marked in the resolution if I felt that I did not come within that line of service, as I should feel hurt at having a great victory passed over without notice. I beg to inform your lordship that the port of Toulon has never been blockaded by me quite the reverse. Every opportunity has been offered to the enemy to put to sea, for it is there that we hope to realise the hopes and expectations of our country. Nelson then remarked that the junior flag officers of his fleet had been omitted in this vote of thanks, and his surprise at the omission was expressed with more asperity, perhaps, than an offence so entirely and manifestly unintentional deserved but it arose from that generous regard for the feelings, as well as interests, of all who were under his command, which made him as much beloved in the fleets of Britain as he was dreaded in those of the enemy. Never was any commander more beloved. He governed men by their reason and their affectations. They knew that he was incapable of caprice or tyranny and they obeyed him with alacrity and joy, because he possessed their confidence as well as their love. Our Nell, they used to say, is as brave as a lion, and as gentle as a lamb. Severe discipline he detested, though he had been bred in a severe school. He never inflicted corporal punishment, if it were possible to avoid it, and when compelled to enforce it, he, who was familiar with wounds and death, suffered like a woman. In his whole life Nelson was never known to act unkindly towards an officer. If he was asked to prosecute one for ill behaviour, he used to answer that there was no occasion for him to ruin a poor devil who was sufficiently his own enemy to ruin himself. But in Nelson there was more than the easiness and humanity of a happy nature. He did not merely sustain from injury. His was an active and watchful benevolence, ever desirous not only to render justice, but do good. During the peace he had spoken in Parliament upon the abuses respecting prize money, 
and had submitted plans to government for more easily manning the navy and preventing desertion from it by bettering the condition of the seamen he proposed that their certificates should be registered and that every man who had served with a good character five years in war should receive a bounty of two guineas annually after that time and of four guineas after eight years this he said might at first sight appear an enormous sum for the state to pay but the average life of a seaman is from hard service finished at forty-five he cannot therefore enjoy the annuity many years and the interest of the money saved by their not deserting would go far to pay the whole expense to his midshipmen he ever showed the most winning kindness encouraging the diffident tempering the hasty counselling and befriending both recollect he used to say that you must be a seaman to be an officer and also that you cannot be a good officer without being a gentleman a lieutenant wrote to him to say that he was dissatisfied with his captain nelson's answer was in that spirit of perfect wisdom and perfect goodness which regulated his whole conduct towards those who were under his command i have just received your letter and i am truly sorry that any difference should arise between your captain who has the reputation of being one of the bright officers of the service and yourself a very young man and a very young officer who must naturally have much to learn therefore the chance is that you are perfectly wrong in the disagreement however as your present situation must be very disagreeable i will certainly take an early opportunity of removing you provided your conduct to your present captain be such that another may not refuse to receive you the gentleness and benignity of his disposition never made him forget what was due to discipline being on one occasion applied to to save a young officer from a court-martial which he had provoked by his misconduct his reply was that he would do everything in his power to oblige so gallant and good an officer as sir john warren in whose name the intercession had been made but what he added would he do if he were here exactly what i have done and am still willing to do the young man must write a letter of contrition as would be an acknowledgment of his great fault and with a sincere promise if his captain will intercede to prevent the impending court-martial never to so misbehave again on his captain's enclosing me such a letter with a request to cancel the order for the trial i might be induced to do it but the letter and the reprimand will be given in the public order book of the fleet and read to all the officers the young man has pushed himself forward to notice and he must take the consequence it was upon the quarter-deck in the face of the ship's company that he treated his captain with contempt and i am in duty bound to support the authority and consequence of every officer under my command a poor ignorant seaman is for ever punished for contempt to his superiors a dispute occurred in the fleet while it was off toulon which called forth nelson's zeal for the rights and interests of the navy some young artillery officers serving on board the bomb vessels refused to let their men perform any other duty but what related to the mortars they wished to have it established that their corps was not subject to the captain's authority the same pretensions were made in the channel fleet about the same time and the artillery rested their claims to separate and independent authority on board upon a clause in the act which they interpreted in their favour nelson took up the subject with all the earnestness which its importance deserved there is no real happiness in this world said he writing to earl st vincent as first lord with all content and smiles around me up start these artillery boys i understand they are not beyond that age and set us at defiance speaking in the most disrespectful manner of the navy and its commanders i know you my dear lord so well that with your quickness the matter would have been settled and perhaps some of them been broke 
I am perhaps more patient, but I do assure you not less resolved if my plan of conciliation is not attended to. You and I are on the eve of quitting the theatre of our exploits, but we hold it to our successors never, whilst we have a tongue to speak or a hand to write, to allow the navy to be, in the smallest degree, injured in its discipline by our conduct. To Trowbridge he wrote in the same spirit. It is the old history, trying to do away the Act of Parliament. But I trust they will never succeed, for when they do, farewell to our naval superiority. We should be prettily commanded. Let them once gain the step of being independent of the navy on board a ship, and they will soon have the other and command us. But, thank God, my dear Trowbridge, the King himself cannot do away the Act of Parliament. Although my career is nearly run, yet it would embitter my future days and expiring moments to hear of our navy being sacrificed to the army. As the surest way of preventing such disputes, he suggested that the navy should have its own corps of artillery, and a corps of marine artillery was accordingly established. Instead of lessening the power of the commander, Nelson would have wished to see it increased. It was absolutely necessary, he thought, that merit should be rewarded at the moment, and that the officers of the fleet should look up to the commander-in-chief for their reward. He himself was never more happy than when he could promote those who were deserving of promotion. Many were the services which he thus rendered unsolicited, and frequently the officer, in whose behalf he had interested himself with the Admiralty, did not know to whose friendly interference he was indebted for his good fortune. He used to say, I wish it to appear as a godsend. The love which he bore the navy made him promote the interests and honour and memory of all who had added to its glories. The near relations of brother officers, he said, he considered as legacies to the service. Upon mention being made to him of a son of Rodney by the Duke of Clarence, his reply was, I agree with your Royal Highness most entirely, the son of a Rodney ought to be the protégé of every person in the kingdom, and particularly of the sea officers. Had I known that there had been this claimant, some of my own lieutenants must have given way to such a name, and he should have been placed in the victory. She is full, and I have twenty on my list. But whatever numbers I have, the name of Rodney must cut many of them out. Such was the proper sense which Nelson felt of what was due to splendid services and illustrious names. His feelings toward the brave men who had served with him are shown by a note in his diary, which was probably not intended for any other eye than his own. November the 7th. I had the comfort of making an old Agamemnon, George Jones, a gunner, into the chameleon brig. When Nelson took the command, it was expected that the Mediterranean would be an active scene. Nelson well understood the character of the perfidious Corsican, who was now sole tyrant of France, and knowing that he was ready to attack his friends as his enemies, knew, therefore, that nothing could be more uncertain than the direction of the fleet from Toulon, whenever it should put to sea. It had as many destinations, he said, as there were countries. The momentous revolutions of the last ten years had given him ample matter for reflection, as well as opportunities for observation. The film was cleared from his eyes, and now, when the French no longer went abroad with the cry of liberty and equality, he saw that the oppression and misrule of the powers which had been opposed to them had been the main causes of their success, and that those causes would still prepare the way before them. Even in Sicily, where, if it had been possible longer to blind himself, Nelson would willingly have seen no evil, he perceived that the people wished for a change, and acknowledged that they had reason to wish for it. In Sardinia the same burden of misgovernment was felt, 
and the people, like the Sicilians, were impoverished by a government so utterly incompetent to perform its first and most essential duties that it did not protect its own coasts from the Barbary pirates. He would fain have had us purchase this island, the finest in the Mediterranean, from its sovereign, who did not receive five thousand a year from it after its wretched establishment was paid. There was reason to think that France was preparing to possess itself of this important point, which afforded our fleet facilities for watching too long not to be obtained elsewhere. An expedition was preparing at Corsica for the purpose, and all the Sards, who had taken part with revolutionary France, were ordered to assemble there. It was certain that, if the attack were made, it would succeed. Nelson thought that the only means to prevent Sardinia from becoming French was to make it English, and that half a million would give the king a rich price, and England a cheap purchase. A better and therefore a wiser policy would have been to exert our influence in removing the abuses of the government, for foreign domination is always in some degree an evil and allegiance neither can nor ought to be made a thing of bargain and sale. Sardinia, like Sicily and Corsica, is large enough to form a separate state. Let us hope that these islands may, ere long, be made free and independent. Freedom and independence will bring with them industry and prosperity, and wherever these are found, arts and letters will flourish, and the improvement of the human race proceed. The proposed attack was postponed. Views of wider ambition were opening upon Bonaparte, who now almost undisguisedly aspired to make himself master of the continent of Europe, and Austria was preparing for another struggle, to be conducted as weakly and terminated as miserably as the former. Spain, too, was once more to be involved in a war by the policy of France, that perfidious government having in view the double object of employing the Spanish resources against England and exhausting them in order to render Spain herself finally its prey. Nelson, who knew that England and the peninsula ought to be in alliance for the common interest of both, frequently expressed his hope that Spain might resume her natural rank among the nations. We ought, he said, by mutual consent, to be the very best friends, and both to be ever hostile to France. But he saw that Bonaparte was meditating the destruction of Spain, and that while the wretched court of Madrid professed to remain neutral, the appearances of neutrality were scarcely preserved. An order of the year 1771, excluding British ships of war from the Spanish ports, was revived and put in force, while French privateers from these very ports annoyed the British trade, carried their prizes in and sold them even at Barcelona. Nelson complained of this to the Captain-General of Catalonia, informing him that he claimed, for every British ship or squadron, the right of lying as long as it pleased in the ports of Spain, while that right was allowed to other powers. To the British ambassador he said, I am ready to make large allowances for the miserable situation Spain has placed herself in, but there is a certain line beyond which I cannot submit to be treated with disrespect. We have given up French vessels taken within gunshot of the Spanish shore, and yet French vessels are permitted to attack our ships from the Spanish shore. Your Excellency may assure the Spanish government that in whatever place the Spaniards allow the French to attack us, in that place I shall order the French to be attacked. During this state of things, to which the weakness of Spain and not her will consented, the enemy's fleet did not venture to put to sea. Nelson watched it with unremitting and almost unexampled perseverance. The station of Toulon he called his home. We are in the right fighting trim, said he. Let them come as soon as they please. I never saw a fleet altogether so well officered and manned. Would to God the ships were half as good. 
the finest one in the service, would soon be destroyed by such terrible weather. I know well enough that if I were to go into Malta, I should save the ships during this bad season, but if I am to watch the French, I must be at sea, and if at sea, must have bad weather, and if the ships are not fit to stand bad weather, they are useless. Then only he was satisfied and at ease when he had the enemy in view. Mr. Elliot, our minister at Naples, seems at this time to have proposed to send a confidential Frenchman to him with information. I should be very happy, he replied, to receive authentic intelligence of the destination of the French squadron, their route, and time of sailing. Anything short of this is useless, and I assure your excellency that I would not, upon any consideration, have a Frenchman in the fleet, except as a prisoner. I put no confidence in them. You think yours good. The Queen thinks the same. I believe they are all alike. Whatever information you can get me, I shall be very thankful for. But not a Frenchman comes here. Forgive me, but my mother hated the French. End of chapter 8, part 2「Eight, Part Three of the Life of Nelson by Robert Southey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Monsieur Latouche Treville, who had commanded at Boulogne, now commanded at Toulon. He was sent for on purpose, said Nelson, as he beat me at Boulogne to beat me again, but he seems very loath to try. One day, while the main body of our fleet was out of sight of land, Rear Admiral Campbell, reconnoitring with the Canopus, Donegal and Amazon, stood in close to the port, and Monsieur Latouche, taking advantage of a breeze which sprang up, pushed out with four ships of the line and three heavy frigates, and chased him about four leagues. The Frenchman, delighted at having found himself in so novel a situation, published a boastful account affirming that he had given chase to the whole British fleet, and that Nelson had fled before him. Nelson thought it due to the Admiralty to send home a copy of the victory's log upon this occasion. As for himself, he said, if his character was not established by that time for not being apt to run away, it was not worth his while to put the world right. If this fleet gets fairly up with Monsieur Latouche, said he to one of his correspondents, his letter, with all his ingenuity, must be different from his last. We had fancied that we chased him into Toulon, for blind as I am, I could see his waterline when he clued his topsails up, shutting in Sepet. But from the last time of his meeting with Captain Hawker in the Isis, I never heard of his acting otherwise than as a poltroon and a liar. Contempt is the best mode of treating such a miscreant. In spite, however, of contempt, the impudence of the Frenchman half angered him. He said to his brother, You will have seen Latouche's letter, how he chased me and how I ran. I keep it, and if I take him, by God, he shall eat it. Nelson, who used to say that in sea affairs nothing is impossible and nothing improbable, feared the more that this Frenchman might get out and elude his vigilance, because he was so especially desirous of catching him and administering to him his own lying letter in a sandwich. Monsieur Latouche, however, escaped him in another way. He died, according to the French papers, in consequence of walking so often up to the signal post upon Serpet to watch the British fleet. I always pronounced that would be his death, said Nelson. If he had but come out and fought me, it would at least have added ten years to my life. The patience with which he had watched Toulon he spoke of truly as a perseverance at sea which would never be surpassed. From May 1803 to August 1805, he himself went out of his ship but three times. Each of those times was upon the king's service, and neither time of absence exceeded an hour. 
the weather had been so unusually severe that he said the mediterranean seemed altered it was his rule never to contend with the gales but either to run to the southward to escape their violence or furl all sails and make the ships as easy as possible the men though he said flesh and blood could hardly stand it continued in excellent health which he ascribed in great measure to a plentiful supply of lemons and onions for himself he thought he could only last till the battle was over one battle more it was his hope that he might fight however said he whatever happens i have run a glorious race he was afraid of blindness and this was the only evil which he could not contemplate without unhappiness more alarming symptoms he regarded with less apprehension describing his own shattered carcass as in the worst plight of any in the fleet and he says i have felt the blood gushing up the left side of my head and the moment it covers the brain i am fast asleep the fleet was in worse trim than the men but when he compared it with the enemy's it was with a right english feeling the french fleet yesterday said he in one of his letters was to appearance in high feather and as fine as paint could make them but when they may sail or where they may go i am very sorry to say is a secret i am not acquainted with our weather-beaten ships i have no fear will make their sides like a plum pudding hostilities at length commenced between great britain and spain that country whose miserable government made her subservient to france was once more destined to lavish her resources and her blood in furtherance of the designs of a perfidious ally the immediate occasion of the war was the seizure of four treasure ships by the english the act was perfectly justifiable for those treasures were intended to furnish means for france but the circumstances which attended it were as unhappy as they were unforeseen four frigates had been dispatched to intercept them they met with an equal force resistance therefore became a point of honour on the part of the spaniards and one of their ships soon blew up with all on board had a stronger squadron been sent this deplorable catastrophe might have been spared a catastrophe which excited not more indignation in spain than it did grief in those who were its unwilling instruments in the english government and in the english people on the fifth of october this unhappy affair occurred and nelson was not appraised of it till the twelfth of the ensuing month he had indeed sufficient mortification at the breaking out of this spanish war an event which it might reasonably have been supposed would amply enrich the officers of the mediterranean and repay them for the severe and unremitting duty on which they had been so long employed but of this harvest they were deprived for sir john ord was sent with a small squadron and a separate command to cadiz nelson's feelings were never wounded so deeply as now i had thought said he writing in the first flow and freshness of indignation i fancied but nay it must have been a dream an idle dream yet i confess it i did fancy that i had done my country service and thus they use me and under what circumstances and with what pointed aggravation yet if i know my own thoughts it is not for myself or on my own account chiefly that i feel the sting and the disappointment no it is for my brave officers and my noble-minded friends and comrades such a gallant set of fellows such a band of brothers war between spain and england was now declared and on the eighteenth of january the toulon fleet having the spaniards to co-operate with them put to sea nelson was at anchor off the coast of sardinia where the madalena islands form one of the finest harbours in the world when at three in the afternoon of the nineteenth the active and seahorse frigates brought this long hoped-for intelligence they had been close to the enemy at ten on the preceding night but lost sight of them in about four hours the fleet immediately unmoored and weighed 
and at six in the evening ran through the straits between Biche and Sardinia, a passage so narrow that the ships could only pass one at a time, each following the stern lights of its leader. From the position of the enemy, when they were last seen, it was inferred that they must be bound round the southern end of Sardinia. Signal was made the next morning to prepare for battle. Bad weather came on, baffling the one fleet in its object and the other in its pursuit. Nelson beat about the Sicilian seas for ten days without obtaining any other information of the enemy than that one of their ships had put into Ajaccio dismasted, and having seen that Sardinia, Naples and Sicily were safe, believing Egypt to be their destination, for Egypt he ran. The disappointment and distress which he had experienced in his former pursuit of the French through the same seas were now renewed. But Nelson, while he endured these anxious and unhappy feelings, was still consoled by the same confidence as on the former occasion, that though his judgment might be erroneous, under all circumstances he was right in having formed it. I have consulted no man, said he to the Admiralty, therefore the whole blame of ignorance in forming my judgment must rest with me. I would allow no man to take from me an atom of my glory had I fallen in with the French fleet, nor do I desire any man to partake of any of the responsibility. All is mine, right or wrong. Then stating the grounds upon which he proceeded, he added, At this moment of sorrow I still feel that I have acted right. In the same spirit he said to Alexander Ball, when I call to remembrance all the circumstances, I approve, if nobody else does, of my own conduct. Baffled thus, he bore up for Malta, and met intelligence from Naples, that the French, having been dispersed in a gale, had put back to Toulon. From the same quarter he learned that a great number of saddles and muskets had been embarked, and this confirmed him in his opinion that Egypt was their destination. That they should have put back in consequence of storms which he had weathered gave him a consoling sense of British superiority. These gentlemen, said he, are not accustomed to a gulf of Lyons gale. We have buffeted them for one and twenty months, and not carried away a spar. He, however, who has so often braved these gales, was now, though not mastered by them, vexatiously thwarted and impeded, and on February the 27th he was compelled to anchor in Pula Bay in the Gulf of Cagliari. From the 21st of January the fleet had remained ready for battle, without a bulkhead up, night or day. He anchored here, that he might not be driven to leeward. As soon as the weather moderated he put to sea again, and after again beating about against contrary winds, another gale drove him to anchor in the Gulf of Palma on the 8th of March. This he made his rendezvous. He knew that the French troops still remained embarked, and wishing to lead them into a belief that he was stationed upon the Spanish coast, he made his appearance off Barcelona with that intent. About the end of the month he began to fear that the plan of the expedition was abandoned, and sailing once more towards his old station off Toulon on the 4th of April, he met the Phoebe with news that Villeneuve had put to sea on the last of March with eleven ships of the line, seven frigates and two brigs. When last seen they were steering towards the coast of Africa. Nelson first covered the channel between Sardinia and Barbary, so as to satisfy himself that Villeneuve was not making the same route for Egypt which Gantheum had taken before him, when he attempted to carry reinforcements there. Certain of this, he bore up on the 7th for Palermo, lest the French should have passed to the north of Corsica, and he dispatched cruisers in all directions. On the 11th he felt assured that they were not gone down the Mediterranean, and sending off frigates to Gibraltar, to Lisbon, and to Admiral Cornwallis who commanded the squadron off Brest, he endeavoured to get to the westward, beating against the westerly winds. After five days a neutral gave intelligence that the French had been seen off Cap de Gat on the 7th. 
it was soon afterwards ascertained that they had passed the Straits of Gibraltar on the day following, and Nelson, knowing that they might already be halfway to Ireland or to Jamaica, exclaimed that he was miserable. One gleam of comfort only came across him in the reflection that his vigilance had rendered it impossible for them to undertake any expedition in the Mediterranean. Eight days after this certain intelligence had been obtained, he described his state of mind thus forcibly in writing to the Governor of Malta. My good fortune, my dear Ball, seems flown away. I cannot get a fair wind, or even a side wind. Dead foul, dead foul. But my mind is fully made up what to do when I leave the Straits, supposing there is no certain account of the enemy's destination. I believe this ill luck will go near to kill me, but as these are times for exertion, I must not be cast down, whatever I may feel. In spite of every exertion which could be made by all the zeal and all the skill of British seamen, he did not get in sight of Gibraltar till the 30th of April, and the wind was then so adverse that it was impossible to pass the gut. He anchored in Mazari Bay on the Barbary shore, obtained supplies from Tetuan, and when on the 5th a breeze from the eastward sprang up, at last sailed once more, hoping to hear of the enemy from Sir John Ord, who commanded off Cadiz, or from Lisbon. If nothing is heard of them, said he to the Admiralty, I shall probably think the rumours which have been spread are true, that their object is the West Indies and in that case I think it my duty to follow them, or to the Antipodes should I believe that to be their destination. At the time when this resolution was taken, the physician of the fleet had ordered him to return to England before the hot months. Nelson had formed this judgment of their destination, and made up his mind accordingly. When Donald Campbell, at that time an admiral in the Portuguese service, the same person who had given important tidings to Earl St. Vincent of the movements of that fleet from which he won his title, a second time gave timely and momentous intelligence to the flag of his country. He went on board the victory, and communicated to Nelson his certain knowledge that the combined Spanish and French fleets were bound for the West Indies. Hitherto all things had favoured the enemy. While the British commander was beating up against strong southerly and westerly gales, they had wind to their wish from the northeast, and had done in nine days what he was a whole month in accomplishing. Villeneuve, finding the Spaniards at Cartagena were not in a state of equipment to join him, dared not wait, but hastened on to Cadiz. Sir John Ord necessarily retired at his approach. Admiral Gravina, with six Spanish ships of the line and two French, came out to him, and they sailed without a moment's loss of time. They had about three thousand French troops on board, and fifteen hundred Spanish. Six hundred were under orders expecting them at Martinique, and one thousand at Guadeloupe. General Lauriston commanded the troops. The combined fleet now consisted of eighteen sail of the line six forty-four gun frigates, one of twenty-six guns, three corvettes and a brig. They were joined afterwards by two French line of battleships and one forty-four. Nelson pursued them with ten sail of the line and three frigates. Take you a Frenchman apiece, said he to his captains, and leave me the Spaniards. When I haul down my colours, I expect you to do the same, and not till then. The enemy had five and thirty days start, but he calculated that he should gain eight or ten days upon them by his exertions. May 15th he made Madeira, and on June 4th reached Barbados, whither he had sent dispatches before him, and where he found Admiral Cochrane with two ships, part of our squadron in those seas being at Jamaica. He found here also accounts that the combined fleets had been seen from St. Lucia on the 28th standing to the southward, and that Tobago and Trinidad were their objects. This Nelson doubted, 
but he was alone in his opinion, and yielded it with these foreboding words, If your intelligence proves false, you lose me the French fleet. Sir William Myard offered to embark here with two thousand troops. They were taken on board, and the next morning he sailed for Tobago. Here accident confirmed the false intelligence which had, whether from intention or error, misled him. A merchant at Tobago, in the general alarm, not knowing whether this fleet was friend or foe, sent out a schooner to reconnoitre and acquaint him by signal. The signal which he had chosen happened to be the very one which had been appointed by Colonel Shipley of the engineers to signify that the enemy were at Trinidad, and as this was at the close of day, there was no opportunity of discovering the mistake. An American brig was met with about the same time, the master of which, with that propensity to deceive the English and assist the French in any manner which has been but too common among his countrymen, affirmed that he had been boarded off Grenada a few days before by the French who were standing towards the Bocas de Trinidad. This fresh intelligence removed all doubts. The ships were cleared for action before daylight, and Nelson entered the Bay of Paria on the 7th, hoping and expecting to make the mouths of the Orinoco as famous in the annals of the British Navy as those of the Nile. Not an enemy was there and it was discovered that accident and artifice had combined to lead him so far to leeward that there could have been little hope of fetching to windward of Grenada for any other fleet. Nelson, however, with skill and exertions never exceeded, and almost unexampled, bore for that island. Advices met him on the way, that the combined fleets, having captured the Diamond Rock, were then at Martinique on the 4th, and were expected to sail that night for the attack on Grenada. On the ninth, Nelson arrived off that island, and there learnt that they had passed to leeward of Antigua the preceding day, and taken a homeward-bound convoy. Had it not been for false information upon which Nelson had acted reluctantly, and in opposition to his own judgment, he would have been off Port Royal just as they were leaving it, and the battle would have been fought on the spot where Rodney defeated de Grasse. This he remembered in his vexation, but he had saved the colonies, and above two hundred ships laden for Europe which would else have fallen into the enemy's hands, and he had the satisfaction of knowing that the mere terror of his name had effected this and had put to flight the allied enemies, whose force nearly doubled that before which they fled. That they were flying back to Europe he believed, and for Europe he steered in pursuit on the 13th, having disembarked the troops at Antigua, and taking with him the Spartiade, 74, the only addition to the squadron with which he was pursuing so superior a force. Five days afterwards, the Amazon brought intelligence that she had spoke a schooner who had seen them on the evening of the 15th, steering to the north, and by computation, 87 leagues off. Nelson's diary at this time denotes his great anxiety, and his perpetual and all-observing vigilance. June the 21st, midnight, nearly calm, saw three planks which I think came from the French fleet. Very miserable, which is very foolish. On the 17th of July he came in sight of Cape St. Vincent, and steered for Gibraltar. June 18th, his diary says, Cape Spartel in sight, but no French fleet, nor any information about them. How sorrowful this makes me, but I cannot help myself. The next day he anchored at Gibraltar, and on the 20th, says, I went on shore for the first time since June 16th, 1803, and from having my foot out of the victory, two years, wanting ten days. Here he communicated with his old friend Collingwood, who, having been detached with the squadron, when the disappearance of the combined fleets and of Nelson in their pursuit was known in England, had taken his station off Cadiz. 
he thought that Ireland was the enemy's ultimate object, that they would now liberate the Ferrol squadron, which was blockaded up by Sir Robert Calder, call for the Rochford ships, and then appear off Ushant with three or four and thirty sail, there to be joined by the Brest fleet. With this great force, he supposed, they would make for Ireland, the real mark and bent of all their operations. And their flight to the West Indies, he thought, had been merely undertaken to take off Nelson's force, which was the great impediment to their undertaking. Collingwood was gifted with great political penetration. As yet, however, all was conjecture concerning the enemy. And Nelson, having victualled and watered at Tetuan, stood for Quechua on the 24th, still without information of their course. Next day, intelligence arrived that the Curieux Brig had seen them on the 19th standing to northward. He proceeded off Cape St. Vincent rather cruising for intelligence than knowing whither to betake himself. And here a case occurred that more than any other event in real history resembles those whimsical proofs of sagacity which Voltaire in his Zadig has borrowed from the Orientals. One of our frigates spoke to an American, who, a little to the westward of the Azores, had fallen in with an armed vessel, appearing to be a dismasted privateer, deserted by her crew, which had been run on board by another ship, and had been set fire to. But the fire had gone out. A logbook and a few seamen's jackets were found in the cabin, and these were brought to Nelson. The logbook closed with these words two large vessels in the west-northwest, and this led him to conclude that the vessel had been an English privateer cruising off the western islands. But there was in this book a scrap of dirty paper filled with figures. Nelson, immediately upon seeing it, observed that the figures were written by a Frenchman, and after studying this for a while said, I can explain the whole. The jackets are of French manufacture, and proved that the privateer was in possession of the enemy. She had been chased and taken by the two ships that were seen in the west-northwest. The prize-master, going on board in a hurry, forgot to take with him his reckoning. There is none in the logbook, and the dirty paper contains her work for the number of days since the privateer last left Corvo, with an unaccounted-for run, which I take to have been the chase in his endeavour to find out her situation by back reckonings. By some mismanagement, I conclude, she was run on board of by one of the enemy's ships and dismasted. Not liking delay, for I am satisfied that those two ships were the advanced ones of the French squadron, and fancying we were close at their heels, they set fire to the vessel and abandoned her in a hurry. If this explanation be correct, I infer from it that they are gone more to the northward, and more to the northward I will look for them. This course accordingly he held, but still without success. Still persevering, and still disappointed, he returned near enough to Cadiz to ascertain they were not there, traversed the Bay of Biscay, and then, at last hope, stood over for the northwest coast of Ireland against adverse winds, till on the evening of the 12th of August he learnt they had not been heard of there. Frustrated thus in all his hopes, after a pursuit to which, for its extent, rapidity and perseverance, no parallel can be produced, he judged it best to reinforce the Channel fleet with his squadron, lest the enemy, as Collingwood apprehended, should bear down upon Brest with their whole collected force. On the 15th, he joined Admiral Cornwallis off Ushant. No news had yet been obtained of the enemy, and on the same evening he received orders to proceed with the victory and superb to Portsmouth. End of chapter 8
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Sir Robert Calder falls in with the combined fleets. They form a junction with the Ferrol squadron and get into Cadiz. Nelson is appointed to the command. Battle of Trafalgar, victory, and the death of Nelson. At Portsmouth, Nelson at length found news of the combined fleet. Sir Robert Calder, who had been sent out to intercept their return, had fallen in with them on the 22nd of July, sixty leagues west of Cape Finisterre. Their force consisted of twenty sail of the line, three fifty-gun ships, five frigates, and two brigs, his, of fifteen line of battleships, two frigates, a cutter, and a lugger. After an action of four hours, he had captured an eighty-four and a seventy-four, and then thought it necessary to bring to the squadron for the purpose of securing their prizes. The hostile fleets remained in sight of each other till the twenty-sixth, when the enemy bore away. The capture of two ships from so superior a force would have been considered as no inconsiderable victory a few years earlier but Nelson had introduced a new era in our naval history, and the nation felt respecting this action as he had felt on a somewhat similar occasion. They regretted that Nelson, with his eleven ships, had not been in Sir Robert Calder's place, and their disappointment was generally and loudly expressed. Frustrated as his own hopes had been, Nelson had yet the high satisfaction of knowing that his judgment had never been more conspicuously approved, and that he had rendered essential service to his country by driving the enemy from those islands where they expected there could be no force capable of opposing them. The West India merchants in London, as men whose interests were more immediately benefited, appointed a deputation to express their thanks for his great and judicious exertions. It was now his intention to rest a while from his labours and recruit himself, after all his fatigues and cares, in the society of those whom he loved. All his stores were brought up from the victory, and he found in his house at Merton the enjoyment which he had anticipated. Many days had not elapsed, before Captain Blackwood, on his way to London with dispatches, called on him at five in the morning. Nelson, who was already dressed, exclaimed the moment he saw him, I am sure you bring me news of the French and Spanish fleets. I think I shall yet have to beat them. They had refitted at Vigo after the indecisive action with Sir Robert Calder, then proceeded to Ferrol brought out the squadron from thence, and with it entered Cadiz in safety. Depend on it, Blackwood, he repeatedly said, I shall yet give Monsieur Villeneuve a drubbing. But when Blackwood had left him, he wanted resolution to declare his wishes to Lady Hamilton and his sisters, and endeavoured to drive away the thought. He had done enough, he said, let the man trudge it who has lost his budget. His countenance belied his lips, and as he was pacing one of the walks in the garden, which he used to call the quarter-deck, Lady Hamilton came up to him and told him she saw he was uneasy. He smiled and said, no, he was as happy as possible. He was surrounded by his family, his health was better since he had been on shore, and he would not give sixpence to call the king his uncle. She replied that she did not believe him, that she knew he was longing to get at the combined fleets, that he considered them as his own property, that he would be miserable if any man but himself did the business, and that he ought to have them as the price and reward of his two years long watching and his hard chase. Nelson, said she, however we may lament your absence, offer your services, they will be accepted, and you will gain a quiet heart by it. You will have a glorious victory, and then you may return here and be happy. He looked at her with tears in his eyes. 
Brave Emma, good Emma, if there were more Emmas, there would be more Nelsons. His services were as willingly accepted as they were offered, and Lord Barnham, giving him the list of the navy, desired him to choose his own officers. Choose yourself, my lord, was his reply. The same spirit actuates the whole profession. You cannot choose wrong. Lord Barnham then desired him to say what ships and how many he would wish, in addition to the fleet which he was going to command, and said they should follow him as soon as each was ready. No appointment was ever more in unison with the feelings and judgment of the whole nation. They, like Lady Hamilton, thought that the destruction of the combined fleets ought properly to be Nelson's work, that he who had been, half round the sea-girt ball, the hunter of the recreant Gaul, ought to reap the spoils of the chase, which he had watched so long and so perseveringly pursued. Unremitting exertions were made to equip the ships which he had chosen, and especially to refit the victory, which was once more to bear his flag. Before he left London, he called at his upholsterers, where the coffin which Captain Hallowell had given him was deposited, and desired that its history might be engraven upon the lid, saying it was highly probable that he might want it on his return. He seemed indeed to have been impressed with an expectation that he should fall in the battle. In a letter to his brother, written immediately after his return, he had said, We must not talk of Sir Robert Calder's battle. I might not have done so much with my small force. If I had fallen in with them, you might probably have been a lord before I wished, for I know they meant to make a dead set at the victory. Nelson had once regarded the prospect of death with gloomy satisfaction. It was when he anticipated the upbraidings of his wife and the displeasure of his venerable father. The state of his feelings now was expressed in his private journal in these words. Friday night, September 13. At half past ten I drove from dear, dear Merton, where I left all which I hold dear in this world, to go to serve my king and country. May the great God, whom I adore, enable me to fulfil the expectations of my country, and, if it is his good pleasure that I should return, my thanks will never cease being offered up to the throne of his mercy. If it is his good providence to cut short my days upon earth, I bow with the greatest submission, relying that he will protect those so dear to me, whom I may leave behind. His will be done. Amen. 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 Early on the following morning he reached Portsmouth, and having dispatched his business on shore, endeavoured to elude the populace by taking a byway to the beach. But a crowd collected in his train, pressing forward to obtain a sight of his face. Many were in tears, and many knelt down before him and blessed him as he passed. England has had many heroes, but never one who so entirely possessed the love of his fellow countrymen as Nelson. All men knew that his heart was as humane as it was fearless, and there was not in his nature the slightest alloy of selfishness or cupidity, but that, with perfect and entire devotion, he served his country with all his heart, and with all his soul, and with all his strength and, therefore, they loved him as truly and as fervently as he loved England. They pressed upon the parapet to gaze after him when his barge pushed off, and he was returning their cheers by waving his hat. The sentinels, who endeavoured to prevent them trespassing upon this ground, were wedged among the crowd, and an officer who, not very prudently upon such an occasion, ordered them to drive the people down with their bayonets, was compelled speedily to retreat, for the people would not be debarred from gazing till the last moment upon the hero, the darling hero of England. He arrived off Cadiz on the 29th of September, his birthday. 
fearing that, if the enemy knew his force, they might be deterred from venturing to sea, he kept out of sight of land, desiring Collingwood to fire no salute and hoist no colours, and wrote to Gibraltar to request that the force of the fleet might not be inserted there in the Gazette. His reception in the Mediterranean fleet was as gratifying as the farewell of his countrymen at Portsmouth. The officers who came on board to welcome him forgot his rank as commander in their joy at seeing him again. On the day of his arrival, Villeneuve received orders to put to sea the first opportunity. Villeneuve, however, hesitated when he heard that Nelson had resumed the command. He called a council of war, and their determination was that it would not be expedient to leave Cadiz unless they had reason to believe themselves stronger by one-third than the British force. In the public measures of this country, secrecy is seldom practicable, and seldom attempted. Here, however, by the precautions of Nelson, and the wise measures of the Admiralty, the enemy were for once kept in ignorance. For, as the ships appointed to reinforce the Mediterranean fleet were dispatched singly, each as soon as it was ready, their collected number was not stated in the newspapers, and their arrival was not known to the enemy. But the enemy knew that Admiral Lewis, with six sail, had been detached for stores and water to Gibraltar. Accident also contributed to make the French Admiral doubt whether Nelson himself had actually taken the command. An American, lately arrived from England, maintained that it was impossible, for he had seen him only a few days before in London, and at that time there was no rumour of his going again to sea. The station which Nelson had chosen was some fifty or sixty miles to the west of Cadiz, near Cape St. Mary's. At this distance he hoped to decoy the enemy out while he guarded against the danger of being caught with a westerly wind near Cadiz, and driven within the straits. The blockade of the port was rigorously enforced, in hopes that the combined fleet might be forced to sea by want. The Danish vessels, therefore, which were carrying provisions from the French ports in the bay, under the name of Danish property, to all the little ports from Ayamonte to Algeciras, from whence they were conveyed in coasting boats to Cadiz, were seized. Without this proper exertion of power, the blockade would have been rendered nugatory by the advantage thus taken of the neutral flag. The supplies from France were thus effectually cut off. There was now every indication that the enemy would speedily venture out. Officers and men were in the highest spirits at the prospect of giving them a decisive blow, such, indeed, as would put an end to all further contest upon the seas. Theatrical amusements were performed every evening in most of the ships, and God Save the King was the hymn with which the sports concluded. I verily believe, said Nelson, writing on the 6th of October, that the country will soon be put to some expense on my account, either a monument or a new pension and honours, for I have not the smallest doubt but that a very few days, almost hours, will put us in battle. The success no man can ensure, but for the fighting them, if they can be got at, I pledge myself, the sooner the better. I don't like to have these things upon my mind. At this time he was not without some cause of anxiety. He was in want of frigates, the eyes of the fleet, as he always called them, to the want of which the enemy before were indebted for their escape, and Bonaparte for his arrival in Egypt. He had only twenty-three ships, others were on the way, but they might come too late, and though Nelson never doubted of victory, Mere victory was not what he looked to. He wanted to annihilate the enemy's fleet. The Cartagena squadron might effect a junction with the fleet on the one side, and on the other it was to be expected that a similar attempt would be made by the French from Brest. In either case, a formidable contingency to be apprehended by the blockading force. The Rochefort squadron did push out, 
and had nearly caught the Agamemnon and Le Miable on their way to reinforce the British Admiral. Yet Nelson at this time weakened his own fleet. He had the unpleasant task to perform of sending home Sir Robert Calder, whose conduct was to be made the subject of a court-martial, in consequence of the general dissatisfaction which had been felt and expressed at his imperfect victory. Sir Robert Calder and Sir John Ord, Nelson believed, to be the only two enemies whom he had ever had in his profession, and, from that sensitive delicacy which distinguished him, this made him the more scrupulously anxious to show every possible mark of respect and kindness to Sir Robert. He wished to detain him till after the expected action, when the services which he might perform, and the triumphant joy which would be excited, would leave nothing to be apprehended from an inquiry into the previous engagement. Sir Robert, however, whose situation was very painful, did not choose to delay a trial from the result of which he confidently expected a complete justification. And Nelson, instead of sending him home in a frigate, insisted on his returning in his own ninety-gun ship, ill as such a ship could at that time be spared. Nothing could be more honourable than the feeling by which Nelson was influenced, but at such a crisis it ought not to have been indulged. On the ninth, Nelson sent Collingwood what he called in his diary the Nelson Touch. I send you, said he, my plan of attack, as far as a man dare venture to guess at the very uncertain position the enemy may be found in. But it is to place you perfectly at ease respecting my intentions, and to give full scope to your judgment for carrying them into effect. We can, my dear Col, have no little jealousies. We have only one great object in view, that of annihilating our enemies, and getting a glorious peace for our country. No man has more confidence in another than I have in you, and no man will render your services more justice than your very old friend Nelson and Bronte. The order of sailing was to be the order of battle. The fleet, in two lines, with an advanced squadron of eight of the fastest sailing two-deckers. The second in command, having the entire direction of his line, was to break through the enemy about the twelfth ship from their rear. He would lead through the centre, and the advanced squadron was to cut off three or four ahead of the centre. This plan was to be adapted to the strength of the enemy, so that they should always be one-fourth superior to those whom they cut off. Nelson said that his admirals and captains, knowing his precise object to be that of a close and decisive action, would supply any deficiency of signals and act accordingly. In case signals cannot be seen or clearly understood, no captain can do wrong if he places his ship alongside that of an enemy. One of the last orders of this admirable man was that the name and family of every officer, seaman and marine who might be killed or wounded in action should be as soon as possible returned to him in order to be transmitted to the chairman of the patriotic fund, that the case might be taken into consideration for the benefit of the sufferer or his family. About half-past nine in the morning of the 19th, the Mars, being the nearest to the fleet of the ships which formed the line of communication with the frigates in shore, repeated the signal that the enemy was coming out of port. The wind was at this time very light, with partial breezes, mostly from the south-southwest. Nelson ordered the signal to be made for a chase in the south-east quarter. About two, the repeating ships announced that the enemy were at sea. All night the British fleet continued under all sail, steering to the southeast. At daybreak they were in the entrance of the straits, but the enemy was not in sight. About seven, one of the frigates made signal that the enemy were bearing north. Upon this the victory hove to and shortly afterwards Nelson made all sail again to the northward. In the afternoon the wind blew fresh from the southwest, and the English began to fear that the foe might be forced to return to port. 
A little before sunset, however, Blackwood, in the Euryalus, telegraphed that they appeared determined to go to the westward, and that, said the Admiral in his diary, they shall not do if it is in the power of Nelson and Bronte to prevent them. Nelson had signified to Blackwood that he depended upon him to keep sight of the enemy. They were observed so well that all their motions were made known to him, and, as they wore twice, he inferred that they were aiming to keep the port of Cadiz open and would retreat there as soon as they saw the British fleet. For this reason he was very careful not to approach near enough to be seen by them during the night. At daybreak the combined fleets were distinctly seen from the victory's desk, formed in a close line of battle ahead on the starboard tack, about twelve miles to leeward, and standing to the south. Our fleet consisted of twenty-seven sail of the line and four frigates, theirs of thirty-three and seven large frigates. Their superiority was greater in size and weight of metal than in numbers. They had four thousand troops on board, and the best riflemen who could be procured, many of them Tyrolese, were dispersed through the ships. Little did the Tyrolese, and little did the Spaniards at that day, imagine what horrors the wicked tyrant whom they served was preparing for their country. Soon after daylight, Nelson came upon deck. The 21st of October was a festival in his family, because on that day his uncle, Captain Suckling in the Dreadnought, with two other line of battleships, had beaten off a French squadron of four sail of the line and three frigates. Nelson, with that sort of superstition from which few persons are entirely exempt, had more than once expressed his persuasion that this was to be the day of his battle also, and he was well pleased at seeing his prediction about to be verified. The wind was now from the west, light breezes, with a long, heavy swell. Signal was made to bear down upon the enemy in two lines, and the fleet set all sail. Collingwood, in the Royal Sovereign, led the lee line of thirteen ships. The victory led the weather line of fourteen. Having seen that all was as it should be, Nelson retired to his cabin and wrote this prayer. May the great God whom I worship grant to my country, for the benefit of Europe in general, a great and glorious victory, and may no misconduct in any one tarnish it and may humanity after victory be the predominant feature in the British fleet. For myself individually I commit my life to him that made me, and may his blessing alight on my endeavours for serving my country faithfully. To him I resign myself, and the just cause which is entrusted to me to defend. Amen, amen, amen. Having thus discharged his devotional duties, he annexed in the same diary the following remarkable writing. October 21st, 1805, then in sight of the combined fleets of France and Spain, distant about ten miles. Whereas the eminent services of Emma Hamilton, widow of the Right Honourable Sir William Hamilton, have been of the very greatest service to my king and country, to my knowledge, without ever receiving any reward from either our king or country. First, that she obtained the King of Spain's letter in 1796 to his brother, the King of Naples, acquainting him of his intention to declare war against England, from which letter the Ministry sent out orders to the then Sir John Jarvis to strike a stroke, if opportunity offered, against either the arsenals of Spain or her fleets. That neither of these was done is not the fault of Lady Hamilton. The opportunity might have been offered. Secondly, the British fleet under my command could never have returned the second time to Egypt, had not Lady Hamilton's influence with the Queen of Naples caused letters to be wrote to the Governor of Syracuse, that he was to encourage the fleet's being supplied with everything, should they put into any port in Sicily we put in to Syracuse, and received every supply, went to Egypt, and destroyed the French fleet. 
could i have rewarded these services i would not now call upon my country but as that has not been in my power i leave emma lady hamilton therefore a legacy to my king and country that they will give her an ample provision to maintain her rank in life i also leave to the beneficence of my country my adopted daughter horatia nelson thompson and i desire she will use in future the name of nelson only these are the only favours i ask of my king and country at this moment when i am going to fight their battle may god bless my king and country and all those i hold dear my relations it is needless to mention they will of course be amply provided for nelson and bronte witness henry blackwood t m hardy the child of whom this writing speaks was believed to be his daughter and so indeed he called her the last time that he pronounced her name she was then about five years old living at merton under lady hamilton's care the last minutes which nelson passed at merton were employed in praying over this child as she lay sleeping a portrait of lady hamilton hung in his cabin and no catholic ever beheld the picture of his patron saint with devout reverence the undisguised and romantic passion with which he regarded it amounted almost to superstition and when the portrait was now taken down in clearing for action he desired the men who removed it to take care of his guardian angel in this manner he frequently spoke of it as if he believed there were a virtue in the image he wore a miniature of her also next his heart blackwood went on board the victory about six he found him in good spirits but very calm not in that exhilaration which he had felt upon entering into battle at abukir and copenhagen he knew that his own life would be particularly aimed at and seems to have looked for death with almost as sure an expectation as for victory his whole attention was fixed upon the enemy they tacked to the northward and formed their line on the larboard tack thus bringing the shoals of trafalgar and san pedro under the lee of the british and keeping the port of cadiz open for themselves this was judiciously done and nelson aware of all the advantages which it gave them made signal to prepare to anchor villeneuve was a skilful seaman worthy of serving a better master and a better cause his plan of defence was as well conceived and as original as the plan of attack he formed the fleet in a double line every alternate ship being about a cable's length to the windward of her second ahead and a stern. nelson certain of a triumphant issue to the day asked blackwood what he should consider a victory that officer answered that considering the handsome way in which the battle was offered by the enemy their apparent determination for a fair trial of strength and the situation of the land he thought it would be a glorious result if fourteen were captured he replied i shall not be satisfied with less than twenty soon afterwards he asked him if he did not think there was a signal wanting captain blackwood made answer he thought the whole fleet seemed very clearly to understand what they were about these words were scarcely spoken before that signal was made which will be remembered as long as the language or even the memory of england shall endure nelson's last signal england expects every man to do his duty it was received throughout the fleet with the shout of answering acclamation made sublime by the spirit which it breathed and the feeling which it expressed now said lord nelson i can do no more we must trust to the great disposer of all events and the justice of our cause i thank god for this great opportunity of doing my duty he wore that day as usual his admiral's frock coat bearing on the left breast four stars of the different orders with which he was invested 
ornaments which rendered him so conspicuous a mark for the enemy were beheld with ominous apprehensions by his officers it was known that there were riflemen on board the french ships and it could not be doubted but that his life would be particularly aimed at they communicated their fears to each other and the surgeon mr beatty spoke to the chaplain dr scott and to mr scott the public secretary desiring that some person would entreat him to change his dress or cover the stars but they knew that such a request would highly displease him in honour i gained them he had said when such a thing had been hinted to him formally and in honour i will die with them mr beatty however would not have been deterred by any fear of exciting his displeasure from speaking to him himself upon a subject in which the wheel of england as well as the life of nelson was concerned but he was ordered from the deck before he could find an opportunity this was a point upon which nelson's officers knew that it was hopeless to remonstrate or reason with him but both blackwood and his own captain hardy represented to him how advantageous to the fleet it would be for him to keep out of action as long as possible and he consented at last to let the leviathan and the temeraire which were sailing abreast of the victory be ordered to pass ahead yet even here the last infirmity of his noble mind was indulged for these ships could not pass ahead if the victory continued to carry all her sail and so far was nelson from shortening sail that it was evident he took pleasure in pressing on and rendering it impossible for them to obey his own orders a long swell was setting into the bay of cadiz our ships crowding all sail moved majestically before it with light winds from the southwest the sun shone on the sails of the enemy and their well-formed line with their numerous three-deckers made an appearance which any other assailants would have thought formidable but the british sailors only admired the beauty and the splendour of the spectacle and in full confidence of winning what they saw remarked to each other what a fine sight yonder ships would make at spithead End of chapter nine part one Chapter Nine, Part Two, of the Life of Nelson by Robert Southey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The French admiral from the Bouchantour beheld the manner in which his enemy was advancing. Nelson and Collingwood each leading his line, and pointing them out to his officers, he is said to have exclaimed that such conduct could not fail to be successful yet villeneuve had made his own dispositions with the utmost skill and the fleets under his command waited for the attack with perfect coolness ten minutes before twelve they opened their fire eight or nine of the ships immediately ahead of the victory and across her bows fired single guns at her to ascertain whether she was yet within their range as soon as Nelson perceived that their shot passed over him, he desired Blackwood and Captain Prowse of the Sirius to repair to their respective frigates, and on their way to tell all the captains of the line of battleships that he depended on their exertions, and that if, by the prescribed mode of attack, they found it impracticable to get into action immediately, they might adopt whatever they thought best, provided it led them quickly and closely alongside an enemy. As they were standing on the front of the poop, Blackwood took him by the hand, saying he hoped soon to return and find him in possession of twenty prizes. He replied, God bless you, Blackwood. I shall never see you again. Nelson's column was steered about two points more to the north than Collingwood's in order to cut off the enemy's escape into Cadiz. The lee line, therefore, was first engaged see cried nelson pointing to the royal sovereign as she steered right for the centre of the enemy's line cut through it astern of the santa anna three-decker and engaged her at the muzzle of her guns on the starboard side see how that noble fellow collingwood carries his ship into action 
Collingwood, delighted at being first in the heat of the fire, and knowing the feelings of his commander and old friend, turned to his captain and exclaimed, Rotherham, what would Nelson give to be here? Both these brave officers perhaps at this moment thought of Nelson with gratitude for a circumstance which had occurred on the preceding day. Admiral Collingwood, with some of the captains, having gone on board the Victory to receive instructions, Nelson inquired of him where his captain was, and was told, in reply, that they were not upon good terms with each other. Terms, said Nelson, good terms with each other. Immediately he sent a boat for Captain Rotherham led him, as soon as he arrived, to Collingwood, and saying, Look, yonder are the enemy, bade them shake hands like Englishmen. The enemy continued to fire a gun at a time at the victory, till they saw that a shot had passed through her main to gallant sail. Then they opened their broadsides, aiming chiefly at her rigging in the hope of disabling her before she could close with them. Nelson, as usual, had hoisted several flags, lest one should be shot away. The enemy showed no colours till late in the action, when they began to feel the necessity of having them to strike. For this reason, the Santissima Trinidad, Nelson's old acquaintance, as he used to call her, was distinguishable only by her four decks, and to the bow of this opponent he ordered the victory to be steered. Meantime, an incessant raking fire was kept up upon the victory. The Admiral's secretary was one of the first who fell. He was killed by a cannon shot while conversing with Hardy. Captain Adair of the Marines, with the help of a sailor, endeavoured to remove the body from Nelson's sight, who had a great regard for Mr. Scott. But he anxiously asked, Is that poor Scott that's gone? And being informed that it was indeed so, exclaimed, poor fellow. Presently a double-headed shot struck a party of marines who were drawn up on the poop and killed eight of them, upon which Nelson immediately desired Captain Adair to disperse his men round the ship, that they might not suffer so much from being together. A few minutes afterwards a shot struck the forebrace bits on the quarter-deck, and passed between Nelson and Hardy, a splinter from the bit tearing off Hardy's buckle and bruising his foot. Both stopped and looked anxiously at each other, each supposing the other to be wounded. Nelson then smiled and said, This is too warm work, Hardy, to last long. The victory had not yet returned a single gun. Fifty of her men had been by this time killed or wounded and her main topmast with all her studding sails and her booms shot away. Nelson declared that in all his battles he had seen nothing which surpassed the cool courage of his crew on this occasion. At four minutes after twelve she opened her fire from both sides of her deck. It was not possible to break the enemy's line without running on board one of their ships. Hardy informed him of this and asked which he would prefer. Nelson replied, Take your choice, Hardy, it does not signify much. The master was then ordered to put the helm to port, and the victory ran on board the Redoutable, just as her tiller ropes were shot away. The French ships received her with a broadside, then instantly let down her lower deck ports for fear of being boarded through them, and never afterwards fired a great gun during the action. Her tops, like those of all the enemy ships, were filled with riflemen. Nelson never placed musketry in his tops. He had a strong dislike to the practice, not merely because it endangers setting fire to the sails, but also because it is a murderous sort of warfare by which individuals may suffer, and a commander now and then be picked off, but which never can decide the fate of a general engagement. Captain Harvey, in the Temeraire, fell on board the Redoutable on the other side. Another enemy was in like manner on board the Temeraire, so that these four ships formed as compact a tier as if they had been moored together, their heads lying all the same way. The lieutenants of the Victory, seeing this, depressed their guns in the middle and lower decks, and fired with a diminished charge, lest the shot should pass through and injure the Temeraire 
and because there was danger that the redoutable might take fire from the lower deck guns the muzzles of which touched her side when they were run out the firemen of each gun stood ready with a bucket of water which as soon as the gun was discharged he dashed into the hole made by the shot an incessant fire was kept up from the victory from both sides her larboard guns playing upon the Tor and the huge santissima trinidad it had been part of nelson's prayer that the british fleet might be distinguished by humanity in the victory which he expected setting an example himself he twice gave orders to cease firing upon the redoutable supposing that she had struck because her great guns were silent for as she carried no flag there was no means of instantly ascertaining the fact from this ship which he had thus twice spared he received his death a ball fired from her mizzen top which in the then situation of the two vessels was not more than fifteen yards from that part of the deck where he was standing struck the epaulet on his left shoulder about a quarter after one just in the heat of the action he fell upon his face on the spot which was covered with his poor secretary's blood hardy who was a few steps from him turning round saw three men raising him up they have done for me at last hardy said he i hope not cried hardy yes he replied my backbone is shot through yet even now not for a moment losing his presence of mind he observed as they were carrying him down the ladder that the tiller ropes which had been shot away were not yet replaced and ordered that new ones should be rove immediately then that he might not be seen by the crew he took out his handkerchief and covered his face and his stars had he but concealed these badges of honour from the enemy england perhaps would not have had cause to receive with sorrow the news of the battle of trafalgar the cockpit was crowded with wounded and dying men over whose bodies he was with some difficulty conveyed and laid upon a pallet in the midshipman's berth it was soon perceived upon examination that the wound was mortal this however was concealed from all except captain hardy the chaplain and the medical attendants he himself being certain from the sensation in his back and the gush of blood which he felt momentarily within his breast that no human care could avail him insisted that the surgeon should leave him and attend to those to whom he might be useful for said he you can do nothing for me all that could be done was to fan him with paper and frequently to give him lemonade to alleviate his intense thirst he was in great pain and expressed much anxiety for the event of the action which now began to declare itself as often as a ship struck the crew of the victory hurrahed and at every hurrah a visible expression of joy gleamed in the eyes and marked the countenance of the dying hero but he became impatient to see captain hardy and as that officer though often sent for could not leave the deck nelson feared that some fatal cause prevented him and repeatedly cried will no one bring hardy to me he must be killed he is surely dead an hour and ten minutes elapsed from the time when nelson received his wound before hardy could come to him they shook hands in silence hardy in vain struggling to suppress the feelings of that most painful and yet sublimest moment well hardy said nelson how goes the day with us very well replied hardy ten ships have struck but five of their van have tacked and show an intention of bearing down upon the victory i have called two or three of our fresh ships round and have no doubt of giving them a drubbing i hope said nelson none of our ships have struck hardy answered there was no fear of that then and not till then nelson spoke of himself i am a dead man hardy said he i am going fast it will be all over with me soon come nearer to me let my dear lady hamilton have my hair and all other things belonging to me hardy observed that he hoped mr beatty could yet hold out some prospect of life oh no he replied it is impossible my back is shot through beatty will tell you so 
Captain Hardy then once more shook hands with him, and with a heart almost bursting, hastened upon deck. By this time, all feeling below the breast was gone, and Nelson, having made the surgeon ascertain this, said to him, You know I am gone, I know it. I feel something rising in my breast, putting his hand on his left side, which tells me so. And upon Beatty inquiring whether his pain was very great, he replied, So great that he wished he was dead. Yet, said he in a lower voice, one would like to live a little longer too. And after a few minutes, in the same undertone, he added, What would become of poor Lady Hamilton if she knew my situation? Next to his country she occupied his thoughts. Captain Hardy, some fifty minutes after he had left the cockpit, returned, and again taking the hand of his dying friend and commander, congratulated him on having gained a complete victory. How many of the enemy were taken he did not know, as it was impossible to perceive them distinctly, but fourteen or fifteen at least. That's well, cried Nelson, but I bargained for twenty. And then, in a stronger voice, he said, Anchor, Hardy, anchor. Hardy, upon this, hinted that Admiral Collingwood would take upon himself the direction of affairs. Not while I live, Hardy, said the dying Nelson, ineffectually endeavouring to raise himself from the bed. Do you anchor? His previous order for preparing to anchor had shown how clearly he foresaw the necessity of this. Presently, calling Hardy back, he said to him in a low voice, Don't throw me overboard, and he desired that he might be buried by his parents, unless it should please the king to order otherwise. Then, reverting to private feelings, Take care of my dear Lady Hamilton, Hardy. Take care of poor Lady Hamilton. Kiss me, Hardy, said he. Hardy knelt down and kissed his cheek, and Nelson said, Now I am satisfied. Thank God I have done my duty. Hardy stood over him in silence for a moment or two, then knelt again and kissed his forehead. Who is that? said Nelson, and being informed, he replied, God bless you, Hardy. And Hardy then left him forever. Nelson now desired to be turned upon his right side, and said, I wish I had not left the deck, for I shall soon be gone. Death was indeed rapidly approaching. He said to the chaplain, Doctor, I have not been a great sinner, and after a short pause, remember that I leave Lady Hamilton and my daughter Horatia as a legacy to my country. His articulation now became difficult, but he was distinctly heard to say, Thank God I have done my duty. These words he had repeatedly pronounced, and they were the last words which he uttered. He expired at thirty minutes after four, three hours and a quarter after he had received his wound. Within a quarter of an hour after Nelson was wounded, about fifty of the victory's men fell by the enemy's musketry. They, however, on their part, were not idle, and it was not long before there were only two Frenchmen left alive in the mizzen top of the Redoutable. One of them was the man who had given the fatal wound. He did not live to boast of what he had done. An old quartermaster had seen him fire, and easily recognised him because he wore a glazed cocked hat and a white frock. This quartermaster and two midshipmen, Mr. Collingwood and Mr. Pollard were the only persons left on the victory's poop. The two midshipmen kept firing at the top, and he supplied them with cartridges. One of the Frenchmen, attempting to make his escape down the rigging, was shot by Mr. Pollard and fell on the poop. But the old quartermaster, as he cried out, That's he, that's he, and pointed at the other, who was coming forward to fire again, received a shot in his mouth and fell dead. Both the midshipmen then fired at the same time, and the fellow dropped in the top. When they took possession of the prize, they went into the mizzen top and found him dead, with one ball through his head and another through his breast. The Redoutable struck within twenty minutes after the fatal shot had been fired from her. 
During that time she had been twice on fire, in her forechains and in her forecastle. The French, as they had done in other battles, made use in this of fireballs and other combustibles, implements of destruction which other nations, from a sense of honour and humanity, have laid aside, which add to the suffering of the wounded without determining the issue of the combat, which none but the cruel would employ, and which never can be successful against the brave. Once they succeeded in setting fire from the redoutable to some ropes and canvas on the victory's booms, the cry ran through the ship and reached the cockpit, but even this dreadful cry produced no confusion. The men displayed that perfect self-possession in danger by which English seamen are characterised. They extinguished the flames on board their own ship, and then hastened to extinguish them in the enemy by throwing buckets of water from the gangway. When the Redoutable had struck, it was not practicable to board her from the victory, for though the two ships touched, the upper works of both fell in so much that there was a great space between their gangways, and she could not be boarded from the lower or middle decks, because her ports were down. Some of our men went to Lieutenant Quillam, and offered to swim under her bows and get up there, but it was thought unfit to hazard brave lives in this manner. What our men would have done from gallantry, some of the crew of the Santissima Trinidad did to save themselves. Unable to stand the tremendous fire of the victory, whose larboard guns played against this great four-decker, and not knowing how else to escape them, nor where else to betake themselves for protection, many of them leapt overboard and swam to the victory, and were actually helped up her sides by the English during the action. The Spaniards began the battle with less vivacity than their unworthy allies, but they continued it with greater firmness. The Argonauta and Bahama were defended till they had each lost about four hundred men. The San Juan Nepomuceno lost three hundred and fifty. Often as the superiority of British courage has been proved against France upon the seas, it was never more conspicuous than in this decisive conflict. Five of our ships were engaged muzzle to muzzle with five of the French. In all five the Frenchmen lowered their lower deck ports and deserted their guns, while our men continued deliberately to load and fire till they had made the victory secure. Once amidst his sufferings Nelson had expressed a wish that he were dead, but immediately the spirit subdued the pains of death, and he wished to live a little longer. Doubtless that he might hear the completion of the victory which he had seen so gloriously begun. That consolation, that joy, that triumph, was afforded him. He lived to know that the victory was decisive, and that the last guns which were fired at the flying enemy were heard a minute or two before he expired. The ships which were thus flying were four of the enemy's van, all French, under Rear Admiral Dumanoir. They had borne no part in the action, and now, when they were seeking safety in flight, they fired not only in the victory and the royal sovereign as they passed, but poured their broadsides into the Spanish captured ships, and they were seen to back their topsails for the purpose of firing with more precision. The indignation of the Spaniards at this detestable cruelty from their allies, for whom they had fought so bravely and so profusely bled, may well be conceived. It was such that when, two days after the action, seven of the ships which had escaped into Cadiz came out in hopes of retaking some of the disabled prizes, the prisoners in the Argonata, in a body, offered their services to the British prize-master to man the guns against any of the French ships, saying that if a Spanish ship came alongside, they would quietly go below, but they requested that they might be allowed to fight the French in resentment for the murderous usage which they had suffered at their hands. Such was their earnestness, and such the implicit confidence which could be placed in Spanish honour, that the offer was accepted, and they were actually stationed at the lower deck guns. Dumanois and his squadron were not more fortunate than the fleet from whose destruction they fled. They fell in with Sir Richard Strachan, who was cruising for the Rochefort squadron. 
in the better days of france if such a crime could then have been committed it would have received an exemplary punishment from the french government under bonaparte it was sure of impunity and perhaps might be thought deserving of reward but if the spanish court had been independent it would have become us to have delivered dumanoir and his captains up to spain that they might have been brought to trial and hanged in sight of the remains of the spanish fleet the total british loss in the battle of trafalgar amounted to one thousand five hundred and eighty seven twenty of the enemy struck unhappily the fleet did not anchor as nelson almost with his dying breath had enjoined a gale came on from the southwest some of the prizes went down some went on shore one effected its escape into cadiz others were destroyed four only were saved and those by the greatest exertions the wounded spaniards were sent on shore and assurance being given that they should not serve until regularly exchanged and the spaniards with a generous feeling which would not perhaps have been found in any other people offered the use of their hospitals for our wounded pledging the honour of spain that they should be carefully attended there when the storm after the action drove some of the prizes upon the coast they declared that the english who were thus thrown into their hands should not be considered as prisoners of war and the spanish soldiers gave up their own beds to their shipwrecked enemies the spanish vice-admiral alava died of his wounds villeneuve was sent to england and permitted to return to france the french government say that he destroyed himself on the way to paris dreading the consequences of a court-martial but there is every reason to believe that the tyrant who never acknowledged the loss of the battle of trafalgar added villeneuve to the numerous victims of his murderous policy it is almost superfluous to add that all the honours which a grateful country could bestow were heaped upon the memory of nelson his brother was made an earl with a grant of six thousand a year ten thousand were voted to each of his sisters and a hundred thousand for the purchase of an estate a public funeral was decreed and a public monument statues and monuments also were voted by most of our principal cities the leaden coffin in which he was brought home was cut in pieces which were distributed as relics of saint nelson so the gunner of the victory called them and when at his interment his flag was about to be lowered into the grave the sailors who assisted at the ceremony with one accord rent it into pieces that each might preserve a fragment while he lived the death of nelson was felt in england as something more than a public calamity men started at the intelligence and turned pale as if they had heard of the loss of a dear friend an object of our admiration and affection of our pride and our hopes was suddenly taken from us and it seemed as if we had never till then known how deeply we loved and reverenced him what the country had lost in its great naval hero the greatest of our own and all former times was scarcely taken into the account of grief so perfectly indeed had he performed his part that the maritime war after the battle of trafalgar was considered at an end the fleets of the enemy were not merely defeated but destroyed new navies must be built and a new race of seamen reared for them before the possibility of their invading our shores could again be contemplated it was not therefore from any selfish reflection upon the magnitude of our loss that we mourned for him the general sorrow was of a higher character the people of england grieved that funeral ceremonies public monuments and posthumous rewards were all which they could now bestow upon him whom the king the legislature and the nation would alike have delighted to honour whom every tongue would have blessed whose presence in every village through which he might have passed would have wakened the church bells have given schoolboys a holiday and drawn children from their sport to gaze upon him and old men from the chimney corner to look upon nelson ere they died the victory of trafalgar was celebrated indeed with the usual forms of rejoicing 
but they were without joy for such already was the glory of the british navy through nelson's surpassing genius that it scarcely seemed to receive any addition from the most signal victory that was ever achieved upon the seas and the destruction of this mighty fleet by which all the maritime schemes of france were totally frustrated hardly appeared to add to our security or strength for while nelson was living to watch the combined squadrons of the enemy we felt ourselves as secure as now when they were no longer in existence there was reason to suppose from the appearances upon opening the body that in the course of nature he might have attained like his father to a good old age yet he cannot be said to have fallen prematurely whose work was done nor ought he to be lamented who died so full of honours and at the height of human fame the most triumphant death is that of the martyr the most awful that of the martyred patriot the most splendid that of the hero in the hour of victory and if the chariots and the horses of fire had been vouchsafed for nelson's translation he could scarcely have departed in a brighter blaze of glory he has left us not indeed his mantle of inspiration but a name and an example which are at this hour inspiring hundreds of the youths of england a name which is our pride and an example which will continue to be our shield and our strength thus it is that the spirits of the great and the wise continue to live and to act after them verifying in this sense the language of the old mythologist for gods they are through high jove's counsels good haunting the earth guardians of mankind the end of chapter nine and the end of the life of nelson by robert southey